Hi everybody, welcome to our video course for geometry. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, what we're going to try to do in this course, in addition to whatever published materials you have, in addition to whatever textbook you have, in addition to what other resources you have, we're going to try to give you a little bit of a crash course uh, to give you what the information that you're going to need to do well in this course. So I want to thank you for listening, and I would like to get started. And the way this is going to work is I'm primarily going to work off of this document, which you should have access to. It's a PDF uh, document entitled A Course in Geometry. It, uh, I very highly recommend that you uh, make use of this document. It's got a lot of plain English lessons about all the geometric issues that we're going to discuss. And from time to time we're going to go through it. But also what I'm going to, and I may you know, use other examples as well, but also really primarily what I'm going to do is I'm going to also go through the homeworks. Uh, this document, the homeworks that you have in this course, it might be in your course syllabus, it might be in other resources given to you, but either way, you should have these homeworks. Now, what I obviously recommend very, very strongly is that you do these homeworks without my, uh, you know, without watching this first, because if you do this homework after watching it, it'll be kind of pointless. It's not really going to help you very much with understanding what you're doing. But after you already do your homeworks, and after you've already, uh, you know, uh, given given it your best shot, well then I would recommend watching this video because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to go through the homework and explain how to do all of them. And once we do that, we will, uh, you know, hopefully that'll help you a lot. So for the first chapter, I'm not really going to go through this first chapter here in this in this PDF document, the geometry lessons. Uh, PDF documents, and the reason is because this is not really, chapter number one is about problem solving in geometry. You know, you don't have to know a tremendous amount of geometry for it, you just have to know a little bit about numbers in general and be able to problem solve a little bit. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the homework. Here's homework number one, and so let's take a look at some of these questions here. Like I said before, obviously I can't uh, control what you do in terms of watching this, but I really request that you please try to do these on your own first. And once you, and if you haven't done it, maybe you can go ahead and pause the recording, and I'll still be here when you get back. And then I will be here to walk you through it. Okay, now that you've paused it and given yourself an opportunity to try to do everything first, let us go ahead and look at homework number one. Question number one, again, these are things that are not really geometry based in terms of remembering things and remembering formulas and remembering concepts, but it's more like little like riddles almost. So hopefully these, these could be fun even. A large cube is formed by arranging 27 smaller white cubes of the same size in a cube shape. Three faces which share one corner of the cube are painted red. How many of the smaller cubes will have exactly two red faces? In other words, the outer corners, the outer edges of one corner of the cube is painted red. How many of the smaller cubes will have exactly two faces? Now, a couple of things. First of all, the first thing you need to realize is that a 27, a cube in general is a three-dimensional representation. It's kind of like a three-dimensional square. And the way you figure out the area of, or the volume of a cube is it's the, it's however wide the cube is multiplied by itself three times. In other words, to the third power. 27 is three to the third power. So 27 small cubes making up one large cube is 3 by 3 by 3. If you have a bunch of little blocks, if you have 27 blocks, you can try it out. Otherwise, you're going to have to trust me. If you put three blocks side by side, put you know pile three more on top and three more on top, then you're kind of going to have a square of 9 altogether. If you put two squares next to each other, two more squares of equal size, you're going to have 27 altogether. It's 3 times 3 times 3. So they say three faces which share one corner of the larger cube are painted red. Now, the best thing, the best way to look at this would be to have a Rubik's Cube in front of you. But if you don't have a Rubik's Cube in front of you, you're going to have to deal with my very crude drawing of a three-dimensional 
um, of a three-dimensional cube. Now, again, as you're going to see over and over again in this course, in this uh, course, I am not much of an artist, but hopefully this will give you the opportunity to at least uh, see what I'm talking about. So here we have a representation of a cube, like a box, and everything is three by three by three. If you count the total number of cubes, you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then another nine on each level, another nine behind that, another nine behind that, and you have 27 altogether. So the question says that three, three, fa three faces, in other words, three of the outside, which share one corner are painted red. So it doesn't matter which corner it is. It could be any corner. But since this is our drawing, let's call it this corner, this upper corner over here, which means all three of these sides are painted red. I'm going to color this red. All right, here. Let's... Basically, these whole sides, this is going to be drawn red, this whole area. You know, let me put it in each box just to make it a little easier. This whole side is painted red. I'll put a little red circle in everything that's painted red. This corner is painted red. Okay. These, in other words, these are all the boxes that have red faces, because the question says that three faces would share one corner, the entire faces. Now, they ask you how many of these have exactly two red faces. Well, the corner ones, this guy's going to have three. This cube over here, and here I'll change the color, this cube over here is going to have three. Here, here, and here. So we don't want that one. In terms of how many of them are going to have two, well, it looks like this one's going to have two, so that's one. This one's going to have two, so that's a second one. Uh, it looks like this one's going to have two, so that's a third one. And it looks like this one's going to have two, so that's a fourth one. So I only see four, uh, assuming this, this whole side, this whole side, and this whole side are all painted red, I only see four smaller cubes that are going to be painted red. So again, this question wasn't really a whole lot about geometry, but it's about visualizing the concept in your mind. Let's take a look at homework number two. I'm sorry, question number two over here. And that is, so I think the answer to that is four. Again, just to reiterate, if we look at this diagram over here, we're just painting three sides red and looking at how many of these are going to have two sides painted. This, all of these, this one, this one, this one, all these are only going to have one side painted red at a time. But I see four of them, they're going to have two sides painted red. Okay, so let us take a look at question number two. If all the diagonals are drawn in a polygon with five sides, a pentagon, Pentagon is a five-sided polygon. So let's start this by drawing a five-sided figure. And I'm going to draw one side, two sides, three sides, four sides, five sides. OK, that's what a pentagon is, a five-sided polygon, which means a five-sided figure. Then they ask, what is the maximum number of intersections of two diagonals? This is, this is actually a strangely worded question. I mean, there, there are more complex form, <coughs> formulas <coughs> to determine the number of possible diagonals. But if you have two diagonals, if you have exactly two diagonals, diagonal just means from go, going from one to another, then the maximum number of intersections would actually be just one. I mean, they could also be zero. For example, if you had that diagonal and you had diagonal means from one side to another, then there would actually be zero diagonals, uh, you know, in zero intersections. But if you have exactly two diagonals, you could really only have a total of one. So, I mean, the question, I guess, could be... The way it's worded, it's actually quite easy. Okay, uh, number three here. The measure of one angle, and you know what, the, uh, do, 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 do. well, let's skip number three for a minute, and let's go to number four. Samuel, Martha, James, Katie, and Raphael all go to the movies. James 
insists on sitting next to the aisle. Samuel and Martha must sit next to each other. Raphael sits next to Samuel and next to James. Who's sitting next to Katie? This is an interesting one. This is actually the kind of thing that you might see on the, uh, you know, on the on the law school admissions test. It's kind of a riddle here. So let's see how we would figure this one out. Uh, let's see. We, James insists on sitting at the aisle. So let's draw a little aisle here. And then we've got five seats. One, two, three, four, and five. Let's work this out. James insists on sitting on the aisle, so we're going to put James here. Samuel and Martha must sit next to each other. And Samuel sits next to... Uh, Raphael sits next to Samuel and next to James. So we're going to put Raphael right here. And also we got to put Samuel here because Samuel has to be next to Raphael. And Samuel and Martha must sit next to each other, so we're going to have to put Martha here. And so the only one that's left over here is Katie. Uh, so the question is who sits next to Katie? It's just a matter of drawing it out, and you know the thing actually becomes very easy. I take it back. This this is really too easy for questions on the law school admissions test, which they get a little bit harder. But uh, it, this the only one left, of course, is Martha. Has to be next to Katie. Next, let's look at uh, question three. Let's do that. You know, we'll we'll do the other questions a little bit later on. Um, so let's do number three over here. Uh, the measure of one diagonal of a triangle is twice the measure of the second diagonal. The measure of the third angle is 12 degrees more than the measure of the first angle. What is the measure of the largest angle of the triangle? This is actually a little bit of algebra and a little bit of geometry kind of mixed in. So again, let's copy and paste the question. Let's uh, bring our box here. And OK, there we go. So let's draw our triangle here. OK. OK. Now, what do we have here? We've got one angle is twice the measure of the second angle. Now, whenever I see, we don't know exactly what the first and second is, but I can express the angles in terms of a variable, in terms of x. You know, if you've taken algebra, you may recall that that's the way you always establish a quantity that you don't know. So I'm going to call one angle x and another angle 2x, because one angle is twice the measure of the second. This one up here is twice the measure of this one down here. The third angle is 12 degrees more than the measure of the first angle. So this was the first angle. So it's x plus 12. So we can establish that we can call all three angles x, 2x, and x plus 12. Now, we didn't learn it yet, but I will tell you now, and you may recall this from high school geometry, in Every uh, triangle has to equal up to a total of 180 degrees. All the inside angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So if we're doing this like we would you know, any regular algebraic expression, we would add them all up and they equal to 180. So this would be x, that's the first angle, plus 2x, that's the second angle, plus x plus 12, which is the third angle, has to equal 180. And the way you do this from an algebraic perspective, you add up all the x's. x plus 2x plus x is 4x plus 12 equals 180. Uh, then you'd subtract 12 from each side. Again, hopefully you know how to do this from basic algebra. 180 minus 12 is 168. And so uh, you get each side divided by 4. And x equals 168 divided by 4. Well, 160 divided by 4 is 40, so 168 divided by 4 is 42. So x is 42. Now, if we filled it back in over here, so this is 42. This is 2 times 42, which is 84. And this is 42 plus 12, which is 54. 
course, one way to check our answer to see do they actually add up add up to 180. And if you add them up, 42 plus 54 is 96. 96 plus 84 is 180. So it works. <coughs> so the question is, what is the major of the lar measure of the largest angle? And of course, the largest angle is 84. So that is our answer to that one. Again, there are a few things you needed to know for this one. You needed to know that essentially all the angles in a triangle have to add up to 180 degrees. Our last homework a question, our last question for homework number one is a landscape designer is working on plans for a residential yard. Her client wants a privacy hedge to be planted in the sides of the rectangular backyard. Um, the side bordering the house will not be planted. It gives you a diagram over here, so you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. The plant um, spans five feet when mature. If the backyard is 50 feet deep and 80 feet long, and there is no plant at the corners of the hedge, how many hedge plants will be required? Okay, well, let's figure this out. It should be fairly simple. Now, since each one is five feet, it is going to take 10 hedges on each side, or on this side, it's going to take 10 hedges, 10 on, or to cover this, and 10 hedges to cover that. Now, there is one at the corner over here, so we're going to put one over here and one over here. So how many across the top are you going to need? Uh, assuming the hedges can count for the top also. These ones at the corner can count across the top also because hedges grow in all directions like this. Uh, so instead of 80, normally you would need 16 of them, but because you already have two that count, you know, I guess these corner ones count double because they're right at the corner, so it looks like you'd need 14 of them left. So you got 10 and 10 and 14, which seems to me you would need 34 hedges altogether. Okay, so that's all for homework one, and in the next section we will look at homework two. Now we're going to go over homework number two, so let's go ahead and do that. This is a little bit more conventional than homework number one. This is all about angles and knowing the rules of angles, when they operate, how they operate, etc., etc. So let's take a look at number one. I'm going to put it up over here on the... Uh, on the big board over here, and I'm going to copy and paste the question, which should be right over here. Okay, there we go. So we've got a whole bunch of angles. FAB is 30. Now remember, FAB is, you look at the angle on the middle one in between the two line segments. So FAB is this one. So this is 30. Let me use a little bit of a thinner line so you could see. Fine, this is 30. Uh, GAD GAD is 23 in there, um, and G and F are collinear, which means G and F are on a line. Fine, no problem. Okay, what is the measure of DAE? Sorry, I forgot one more, and that was, of course, CAB is 66. So this one is 66. Now, the first one we can fill in. I'll, I'll use a different color because these are the ones we're going to fill in now. Well, we know that GAF is a line, and we know that lines all together have to equal 180 degrees. All lines, the total angles of a line have to be 180. So this one has to be 180 minus whatever is over here. 66 and 30 is 96, so 180 minus 96 is 84. So this we can fill in as 84 right away. What about DAE? Now, DAE, oh, one more thing I forgot, of course, and that is BA is perpendicular to EA. BA is perpendicular to EA. These two lines are perpendicular to each other, this and this. That means together they equal 90. Now, if together these two equal 90, so if this is 30, so this has to be 60. And we're going to slowly fill in all the rest of the angles. Now, of course, this side of the line over here also has to equal 180 altogether. So 180 minus 60 is 120, minus 23 is 97. So this one has to be 97 degrees. So we've, just, we've put in all of the 
um, all of the angles over here. So now let's go ahead and answer these questions. DAE, we put down as being 97. Uh, name three pairs of supplementary angles. Supplementary angles are angles that equal up to 180. Pairs. So, well, what we know that everything on this line is 180. So how about if we use this angle, BAG and BAF, that would have to equal 180, because really any two angles on the line. So let's take this big angle and this small angle. So let's say... Uh, one of them is BAF, and the other being BAG. A second pair might be the opposite, this angle and this angle. In other words, CAF and CAG. Okay. Uh, and, and the other side, we could use the same. You know, any any two angles on, on this line from the opposite direction also. How about FAE? And F... Um, and GAE. In other words, this angle and this angle. Okay, how about C? Name all the pairs of complementary angles. Complementary angles means angles that equal up to 90 degrees. Well, let's see. What angles are there? Let's see, for number C, for C, well, we know that these two have to equal up to 90. So let's try B, A, F, and F, A, E, because 30 and 60 is 90. Are there any other pairs that equal up to 90? I don't really see any others that are going to equal up to 90. Okay. Name two adjacent angles. And adjacent angles means next to each other. There's an, almost an unlimited number of adjacent angles. Uh, DAE and EAF, uh, BAF and EAF, uh, CAB and CAG. Those are all... Um, adjacent angles to each other. Question number two. In the figure ABP is 72 degrees. ABP 72. So let's put a 72 in here. And the measure of DPE, it's DPE is 55. What's the measure of BP? D. Okay, well that should be simple enough. Notice you have these little a perpendicular sign down here, which means CP is perpendicular to APE, which means that each side, in other words, this angle and this angle, have to be 90 degrees each. So if this is 55, this has to be 90 minus 55, which is 35. Sorry for that, for the sloppy writing. This side over here, of course, has to be 90 minus 72, because this whole thing is 90, this is 72, so this has to be 18. So they want to know D, P, I'm sorry, they want to know B, P, D. So they want to know, like, the V over here, B, P, D. Well, B, P, D, well, you got 18 on one side and 35 on the other, so 18 and 35 is, of course, 53. It's just all these things are just a matter of filling in the angles and just uh, using the next logical progression. Question number three asks us a bunch of triangles over here. The lines mean they're equal to each other. The, you know, like AB is equal to BC over here. This means a right angle, of course. Uh, these means they're equal to each other. GH and I, all these sides are equal to each other. This means it's a right angle again. Okay, so which ones are scalene? Scalene means no sides are equal to each other. No two sides are equal to each other. So the scalene ones, I'll mark them. You know, this would be a scalene one because it doesn't say any two um, sides are equal to each other. So I'll mark this with an S for scalene. This looks like a scalene, and this looks like a scalene. The others are either isosceles, when you have two equal to each other, or equilateral which means that all three sides are equal to each other. Which ones are isosceles? 
Well, this one looks like isosceles because it's got two sides that are equal to each other. And this one looks like isosceles because it has two sides that are equal to each other. This one over here would be an equilateral triangle. That's actually question D. Which ones are right triangles, which means a triangle with a right angle? Well, this one looks like it has a right angle. That's this thing over there. And this one looks like it has a right angle. The others do not. Easy enough. Equilateral triangle is, of course, only this one, because all the sides are equal. And which ones are obtuse? Obtuse means it has an angle that's more than 90 degrees. Now, it looks like this one looks obtuse, because it's got an angle that's more than 90 degrees. This one looks like more than 90 degrees. And this one also looks like more than 90 degrees, so we'll label this one as an obtuse also. Just a matter of recognizing different types of triangles for this question. <clears throat> the next question is about a prism. A prism essentially is a uh, a triangle, but in three dimensions. Not a pyramid, but where you have two, like a tent, where you have a rectangle on the bottom. A, B, F, D is a rectangle, and then you have the sides going up. I mean, this kind of a shape is uh, like a tent is a uh, is a prism. Name the bases of the prism. Well, the bases are the sides that are the outside of the bottom of the prism. BF, FD, DA, and AB, these four bases. I'll put them in red over here. This would be the one, this would be one base. Actually, it's black. This would be a second base. This would be the third base, and this would be the fourth base. Again, it should be fairly obvious why. Lateral faces of the prism means not the base. So the, the base we just looked at, which would be A, B, F, D, you know, this rectangle down here, the lateral faces would be the opposite. They'd really be, there's really four different triangles over here that would be the lateral faces. This area, A, B, C, this triangle, then this, well, this wouldn't be a triangle, this would be a rectangle, B, C, E, C, e F, this whole side, then the other ones that are hidden from view are the back, the opposite side. You know, if, you, if this were solid, you wouldn't be able to see DEF as a base, and you wouldn't be able to say ADEC, this one in the back over here. You know, this, this whole area over here would be a hidden, hidden from view, and this one would be hidden from view. The ones that wouldn't be hidden from view, I'll put in green, would be this one over here, this rectangle, and this triangle over here. The edge are all the lines at the edge of the prism, and there's a whole bunch of them here. There's AB, there's BC, these are all the lines at the outer edge of the prism, AC, CE, DE, DF, essentially all the lines that are over here. Question 5 is actually a very easy one. Question 5 says a surveyor measured his angle to be 13 degrees, 15 minutes, 36 seconds. Now, the degree can be divided up into 60 minutes and a minute into 60 seconds. Nothing to do with time, but uh, if you're measuring something smaller than a degree, you can divide up a degree into 15 minutes, and you can divide it up a minute into, six, into, 30, into 60 seconds. Well, a degree into 60 minutes and a minute into 60 seconds of a degree. So 13 degrees, 15 minutes, and 36 seconds essentially means 13 degrees and then 15 sixtieth of a degree, of a degree and then 36 sixtieth of a sixtieth. In order to use this measure in calculations, he has to turn it into degrees, express this angle in degrees as a decimal fraction of one degree. Well, since a minute is 60 seconds, so a 15 degrees is a quarter of, excuse me, 15 minutes, this middle thing over here, is about a quarter of a degree. So it would be 0.25, it would be about 13.25 degrees, that would be 15 minutes. And so I think you can round it off to that. You can just, at the 36 seconds would add a little bit, but usually uh, you can go to two decimal places. So in other words, it would be about 13 and a quarter degrees, which is about 13 degrees and 15, 13.25 uh, degrees. You can write that in over here. If you were adding to more decimal places, then you might have to factor in this 36 over here as well. Question 7 requires us to do a little bit of 
artistry ourselves. Let's see, an airplane takes off from an airport bearing along AB of north 13 degrees east. So let's draw, you know, in order to visualize this, let's draw a flat line. And this, this will represent the ground. This will represent straight. Okay. And let's put, just to make it nice and easy, let's put north up here. Let's put east over here. And let's put west over here and south down here. So this would be a straight east-west line. So this is of north 13 degrees east, which means let's start from a point in the middle over here. And let's draw over here to a point of 13 degrees. So let's put our 13 in here. Then a second plane leaves the airport at bearing north 30 degrees west, so on the opposite side. It doesn't matter if we draw it precisely, but let's try to draw it so that it looks somewhat normal. 30 degrees here. This is 30 degrees north of west. That's along AC, so we'll put a C over here. On this side, it's at along AB, so we'll put a B over here, and we'll put an A in the middle. Uh, a third plane leaves at south 87 degrees west. 87 degrees south of west. So now, we'll take A along AD. So let's do something like this. And we'll put um, the D over here. So we'll make this 87. So what do they want to know? They want to know the angle of the first and second planes. Third one doesn't really doesn't look like it's um, doesn't really look like it's nece it's a it's an issue. Um, this one doesn't look as necessary, but the point is, since this is a flat line, these three angles, angle 1, angle 2, and angle 3, have to be supplementary, which means they have to equal 180 altogether. Now, if this is 30 and that's 13, so 180 minus 30 is 150, 150 minus 13 is 137, so this one has to be 137 degrees, and that seems to be the angle between the first and the third planes. Okay, homework number three, and this is about really, you know, different dimensions in um, geometry. The first question is about the perimeter. Perimeter is actually very easy. You just count up all the sides, and the lengths of all the sides is the perimeter. So these are actually fairly easy. Let's take a look at this one. Well, these double ticks means that this side is equal to this side, and the single tick means that this side is equal to this side. So if this is 2, then this is 2. And if this is 8, then this is 8. So if you want to do the perimeter, just add up all the sides. 8 plus 8 is 16, plus 2 plus 2 is 20. So the perimeter of A is 20. The second one is just as easy. The single text means this is equal to this. So this is 3, so this is 3. This is 5.5, .5, so this is also 5.5. 5.5 .5. 5 .5 plus 5.5 .5 is 11. 3 plus 3 is 6, so 11 plus 6 is 17. This one, how many sides we got here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's a septagon. There are seven sides. And each side, the ticks are meaning they're all equal to each other. So it's an equilateral septagon, if you will. Uh, there's seven sides. And each one is 2.4. So it's 2.4 times 7, which is 16.8, I believe. So that's your perimeter. 16.8. This side, none of this one, none of them are equal to each other, so you just got to add them all up. Uh, let's see, 2.1 or 1.95 plus 2.0 oh, that makes 4. Um, 6.1, 8.2, Looks like 12.05. Again, you can do it in a calculator. I just did it in my head, but it uh, looks like the perimeter here is 12.05, just added them all up. You know, fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Just perimeter, add them all up, see what you can, see what, uh, 
see what they equal together. Okay, number two, let me drag that over here from the homework. There's only four questions on this particular homework. Some of them are fairly complex. Uh, find the area of the shaded figure. Assume the curves are semicircles. Round the answer to the nearest hundredth. Okay, so really what you do, you need in a shaded area question is you need to figure out the whole shape and then subtract whatever is not shaded. Now this is a rectangle, the entire shape, if you would include this side over here, which is not which is not drawn, but if you would assume that there were a line that's drawn down here, uh, that would be the, the, that would be a rectangle, of course. So the entire rectangle, the area of a rectangle, is always the length times the height. So it would be 14.2 times uh, 6.8, that's the entire amount, which according to my trusty calculator, and again, no reason not to do these on a calculator, is 96.56. So the entire thing is 96 point uh, 56 that's the this the whole the whole rectangle now you got to take out the semicircles now the good thing about this the easy thing that this does is that it gives you two semicircles and two semicircles is one whole circle uh, so you can just take one whole circle pretend you you know you combine them now if you combine them the way to figure out the area of a circle is that the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared. The radius is half of the diameter. Now this whole line over here is 6.8, so half of that, the radius of the circle, which would be from the middle to the end, would be 3.4. So the area of the circle would be pi times 3.4. Now we're going to use 3.14 as pi. And I will round it off because the only thing to the nearest hundredth. So I'm going to do 3.14 times 3.4, which I'm doing on my calculator. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I forgot to square the 3.4. So first thing I got to do is I have to square the 3.4. So that's 3.4 times 3.4, which is 11.56. So A equals pi, which we're going to round to 3.14 times 11.56. So we're going to do that with a multiplication on my little calculator over here, and we get 36.298, so we'll round it off to 36.30. And so to figure it, so this is the area of the circle, in other words, the whole circle, which is these two semicircles, this semicircle and this semicircle. So the area of the shaded region is 96.56 minus 36.30 which comes out to 60.26. This is the area of the shaded figure or the shaded region. All we did, figured out the whole area and subtracted the light area. And again, if you're having trouble with any of these, Please feel free to, you know, to pause it, to rewatch it, or whatever it is. This is a video, of course, so you get to watch it as many times as you like. Okay, uh, let's see number three over here. A sprinkler is set in the corner of a rectangular lawn, lawn 11 feet by 25 feet. So let's draw a rectangle that represents the lawn. A rectangle, let's do the width over here. Oops. So we'll draw this. Uh, over here, and we'll make this the long way. So we'll make this over here, and then we'll draw this side, and this side. All right, good enough. Anyway, so this is 11 by... Or, sorry, 10 by 10 by 25. It's a rectangle with 10 by 25, so we'll put a 10 here and a 25 here. If the maximum distance the sprinkler can reach is 10 feet, so the sprinkler is set in the corner. So the sprinkler will set right over here. 
and the maximum the sprinkler can reach is 10 feet. So the sprinkler, I guess, goes around. You know, the sprinkler can, can go around in kind of a circle. So it can reach 10 feet up. It can reach all the way to this side, and it can reach about 10 feet over here. So the shape that it can reach is actually kind of a quarter circle. Let's draw a, uh, a little bit of a better circle. Something like this. It doesn't really matter if it's even, but the point is this this can only be 10 feet in this direction and 10 feet in that direction. So what are we talking about? What percent of the lawn will be watered from this position? Hmm, good question. So what are we looking for? We're looking for this area as a percentage of the entire area. It's an interesting question. Okay, now but the previous question we had a semicircle. Here we've got about a quarter of a circle. You know, we had a so Let's figure out what the, if this would be a whole circle, you know, if this would be a whole circle like this, what would the whole circle area be? And then we'll just divide it by four. That should be enough. It should be simple enough because it's a quarter of a circle. You can envision this as being a whole circle and only about a quarter of a circle because it's put in the corner. It's kind of a silly thing to do. If you wanted to do the maximum, you'd put, you'd put it in the middle, but that's not the question. The question is it's put in the corner. So, this is a quarter of a circle, so again, the area of a circle is pi r squared. Now, the radius here is 10, because if you did a whole circle, the radius is the distance to the end of the circle, which is 10. Uh, so, it's 10, the area is pi times 10 squared, uh, which is 100, of course. And pi will do as 3.14. 3.14 times 100 is 314. So we'll round this off to approximately 314. What is the area of the entire lawn? Well, obviously, what I forgot to do is to divide this by four. The area is the area of the whole circle would be 314. But since this is only a quarter of a circle, we're going to divide this by four. Now, 314 divided by 4, well, let's see, 320 divided by 4 would be 80. So 316 would be, so it would be 78.5. And again, you can do this on a calculator, but it is fairly simple. I just did 320 divided by 4, which is, which is 80. So take off 6, so it's 78.5. We're rounding it off to 78.5. And the entire area, the entire area of a rectangle is the length times the height. So for the whole rectangle is the... Uh, the base times the height, or the length times the width, doesn't matter which way, you, which way you call it. So that's 25 times 10, which is 250. So the percentage is 78.5 over 250. And I'm going to divide it on my calculator here, 78.5 divided by 250. And I'm getting, interestingly enough, 314. Uh, three, I'm sorry, 0.314, and 0.314, to get the percentage, which they ask you, you just slide the decimal point over two slots, so your answer would be 31.4%. Ironic that we got the same number as we did in terms of pi. So it doesn't really look, let's, look, let's just make sure that we did it right again. 10 by 25, which we did. The maximum of the sprinkler is 10 feet, so in 10 feet in this direction and 10 feet in this direction, which is a quarter of a circle. Pi r squared is 10 times 100 times pi, which is divided by 4 is 78.5. 78.5 divided by 250. Yeah, that looks about right. The drawing isn't great. The real semicircle would probably look more some, something like this. So it looks more like 30% when you do it this way. But anyway, that would be the answer, 31.4%. Question number four is an interesting one. These are interesting. These are fun. At least I think they're fun anyway. You might not agree, but that's okay. Uh, what's the surface area of the prism? Now, the prism means kind of like a box except a rectangle. A rectangular, this is a rectangular prism. That's okay. Uh, it says it's a rectangular prism, as a matter of fact. Uh, it says, now, the rectangular, of course, means the opposite sides are equal. So 9.1 over here and 9.1 over here. Thir this side would be 13.5. Uh, this side would be 9.1. These are actually squares on the outside. Now, the surface area is the total amount on all surfaces. This area, this area, 
and the back area over here, the back area over here, the area on top, and the area on bottom would be all the combined surface areas. So if we had six surface areas, I'd label this as one, this side over here. The bottom I'll label as two. This side, in other words, this box over here, the one facing us, I'll label as three. The back I'll label as four. The top I'll label as five. And the back area over here I'll label as six. It doesn't really matter which one you do. So let's do the one, the one facing us. Well, the one facing us is a square, 9.1 by 9.1. Now, the square, you just multiply uh, multiply e any side by itself. That's 9.1 times 9.1. So the first one I'm getting as 82.81. Now let's do 2, which is the bottom. Now, the bottom one is 9.1 times 13.5 which I'm going to do on my calculator, 9.1 times 13.5, which is 122.85. Number three, which was, what was three? Three was the one facing us, this rectangle, this one over here, the one outlined by this side, this side, this side, and this side, is also, uh, it is, also 13.5 times 9.1, which of course is also going to be 122.85. Side 4 was the back wall, which is the same as the front wall. So that's also going to be 82.81. Side 5 was the top, this one, this, this, and this, which is the same as the bottom. So side 5 is going to be 122.85. Notice it's going to be easy because there are, a lot of them are the same. And side 6 was the back wall as well. Which is the same, which is the same, essentially the same thing. Also, 122.85. Only two real dimensions here. The front wall and the back wall were the 9.1 by 9.1. The other four sides, you know, on each side of the of the prism, and the top and the bottom, were 122.85. So I am going to do that calculation. Uh, these four, if you multiply these four, it becomes 491. You can just do it. Uh, comes 491.2 and 82.81 times 2 was 165.62. So if you add these up, again, without even using a calculator, this becomes a 7, that becomes a 5, and that becomes a 6. So altogether, you've got 657.02. Uh, square feet as the total surface area over here. Homework number four. A lot of interesting applicable application type questions. A baseball diamond is 90 feet on a side. This is actually true of a real baseball diamond. It's 90 feet from home to first, 90 feet from first to second, 90 feet from second to third, etc. A ball is hit to the shortstop who's halfway between second and third. How far must he throw the ball to put the runner out at first base? Let's draw a little line to represent how far he's going to throw the ball. He's going to start from halfway between second and third, and he's going to have to get to first. So we're going to have to figure out how long this line is. You know, writing it very often makes it a lot easier to you know to figure out what the what the length is over what the what you know what the dimensions are so let's fill in what we know well we know from first to second is 40 is 90 feet now it we also know what this side is because it says a bull's hit to the shortstop who's halfway between second and third which means this is 45 now we also know that the bases are right angles oh no i'm sorry yeah, of course. They're not, they're right angles. All, all sides of a square are right angles to each other. So this is a right angle. Now, so once we have these, we can simply use the very famous Pythagorean theorem. A Pythagorean theorem says in any right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c is the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse means the longest side of a right angle. So in this case, we've got one side is 45, one side is 90, and this one, the one that we're looking for is the hypotenuse, because it's the one opposite the right angle. So it would be 90 squared plus 45 squared equals c squared, whatever c squared is going to be. 
and you know let's get a calculator over here 90 squared which is 90 times 90 which of course is going to be 1800 um, I'm sorry 8100 sorry plus 45 squared plus uh, 45 well I'll start the other way 45 squared is 45 times 45 is 2025 plus the 8100 so that gives us 10,125 so I'm gonna write that over here 10,125 equals c squared. Now, like any other equation, you can take the square root of each side in order to get c by itself. So c, which is the third side, equals the square root of 10,125. Let's get our calculator back up here. And we had this up over here, so let's figure out the square root. And the square root is 100.62. So it's approximately 100.62 feet. It goes on for more, but that's a pro that's you can round it off to that. So it's a little bit over 100 feet or 100.62 uh, feet to throw the, throw the ball from the shortstop hole to first base. Question two, another interesting one here. We've got two trucks. One heads south at 58 miles an hour and the other heads east at 63 miles an hour. After an hour and 35 minutes, how far apart are the trucks? Well, let's figure this out. First, we're going to do south. Now, south at 63 miles per hour, one hour and th at one hour and 35 minutes. Now, one hour and 35 minutes is we need to figure out what percentage of that is. Uh, what percentage of an hour is that? Now, 35 minutes is what percentage of an hour? 35 divided by 60 is the same as uh, 7 twelfths. So it would be 7 divided by 12. So essentially 0.58. So it's, in other words, 1 hour and 35 minutes is 1.58 hours. You know, that's the first thing we needed to know. The amount of time over here is 1. Point, let's, let me write that. 1.58 hours. Now, so how far did this go down? Well, he went south at an average of 58 miles an hour for 1.58 hours. So let's get our calculator up here. And our calculator is 1.58 times uh, 58. So that's 91.64, okay, 91.64. East, how far did he go? Well, he went 63 miles an hour, also for an hour, for 1.58 hours. So let's do that again over here. What, 63 miles per hour, okay. So 1.58 hours times 63 miles an hour is 99.54. All right, 99.54. Okay. So we've got a right triangle because one went, one went due south and the other went due east. So this is certainly a right angle. Oops. Oh. This is a right angle. So you can use the Pythagorean theorem again. This is 99.54 squared plus 91.64 squared equals c squared. And for that, you know, honestly, I'm just going to use Excel <laughs> rather than. Uh, you know, rather than, I can do it on the calculator, but just the way you would do it on a calculator, multiply this by itself and put that number here, multiply that number and by itself and do that number here, and then take the square root. So I'm going to just do it on Excel, and the way I'm going to do it on Excel is I'm going to say equals square root of 91.64 to the second power. You can use this little caret to 
the second power, plus 99.54 to the second power. And it looks like about 135.3 is going to be, which makes sense. So that that's about right. So if you did that, if you if you multiplied, if you took if you took this and squared it, and took that and squared it, added them together, take the square root of the product, you're going to get approximately 135.3. Okay, about 145.3 miles. The next question is, again, a Pythagorean theorem question. 12-foot ladder will use to be used to paint the exterior of a house. Now, the foot of the ladder needs to be 3.7 feet from the base of the house. So let's draw the house over here. You know, the side of the house is, goes straight up and down, so we'll draw this as a straight line. OK. Uh, the ladder is going to go be 3.7 feet away from the base of the house, but it's going to reach up 12 feet. It's going to reach 12, um, a 12, it's going to be a 12 foot ladder. So let's put that over there, and then let's use that distance, well, from, from the house. So, what do, what do we know? We know the ladder is 12 feet, so we're going to make this a 12. We know that it's 3.7 feet away from the house, and what are we looking for? We're looking for the maximum height of the letter, so we're looking for x. Now here, unlike the previous two examples, we're still going to use the Pythagorean theorem, but remember, this here is the one that's the right angle, so this is going to be the c. So we're, we can do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The a can be 3.7 squared, plus b, we don't know what that is, so we'll call it x squared equals 12 squared. Well, again, 3.7 times 3.7 is 13.69 plus x squared equals 12 squared, which is 144. And if you're doing this, you just subtract 13.69 in order to isolate x, minus 13.69, which is going to get you x squared equals 130. 0.31. So we've got 130.31, and take the square root of that. So let's you know let's bring up our calculator here. Where's our calculator? Here's our calculator, which is still up stuck on. Whoops, help. Okay, which is still stuck on previous example. Okay, we've got 130.31. And we'll take the square root, which is 11.42. So it's going to reach approximately, oh, this is an approximate number, but it's going to reach approximately 11.42 uh, feet up the house. 12 foot ladder, base 3.7 3 feet away, is going to reach about 11.42 feet up the house. Okay, here's another interesting one. A board foot is the volume of a piece of wood 1 foot by 1 foot by 1 inch. Deck is designed as below. 1 inch by 6 inch boards are used for the surface of the deck. How many board feet are required for this part of the job? Well, okay, first let's figure out the surface area. You know, it's 1 foot by 1 foot. So what's the surface area of this entire thing over here? You know, let's make let's get this diagram over here and make it a little bit bigger so that we can you know, draw on it and make it make a little bit more sense. All right. There we go. Okay. So let's separate this out into two different sections, just to make it two nice and easy shapes over here. Let's put a little border over here, and just a little easier to visualize that way. And let's add them together to see how much there is. Well, the big shape, the big one, is 20 by 8. Now the area, we know an area of a rectangle is the width times the length, or the base times the height. 8 times 20, which is 160. Okay, that's going to cover this whole area. Whoops. And then we've got the little area over here, which is 3 by 3, which is 9. So the whole thing is 169. That's the surface area. But that doesn't cover the whole thing. It says a board foot is 1 foot by 1 foot by 1 inch, and the deck needs 
to be one inch by six inch boards for the surface. So we need six times this many, really, because these are only one inch deep and we need six inches deep. So we need to multiply this number by six, and nine times six is 54, and we've got one, four, ten. So according to my calculations, we've got 1,014 board feet are necessary to cover the deck. Again, I just kind of used the surface area first, broke it apart into manageable pieces, and then once we did that, we realized these are only one, foot, one inch thick, and we need six inches thick, so just simply multiply by six. Another practical application, we've got a cardboard box that needs to be three feet long, one and a half feet wide, and two feet deep, and allowing 5% for waste, how much cardboard will be required to build this box? Well, a box is a rectangular prism. Now, the way to figure out the volume of that is simply to multiply all the dimensions. Ment multiply the length times the width times the height. So we've got 3 times 1.5 times 2. Now, 3 times 1.5 is 4.5. 4 4.5 times 2 is 9. And then we need 5% of 9. Now, 5% of 9 should be relatively easy, but just to make sure, let's do it on the calculator. Uh, five, whoops, again, I think I did this last time too. Um, okay, 5% is 0 0.05 times 9 is point, point 0.45. So we need to add a 0.45 um, cardboard. So basically it's 9.45 cubic feet is the total amount of cardboard we're going to need. 3 times 1.5 times 2, and then an additional 5% to cover wastage. Okay, our next question, we've got another practical, practical question over here. This is a ramp. A ramp is designed as below. The surface is to be made of 1 inch plywood. Then the top surface is to be covered with non-slip coating. Let's make a nice big one so we can see it a little bit better. In fact, let's then delete this one so it doesn't confuse us. Um, okay, so th let's see. We've got these are all feet. Okay, good. The surface is to be made to one inch plywood. So how much plywood is needed and what area will be covered by non-slip coating? Now the top surface, I guess the top surface will be just this here. And all the rest of the stuff is covered by plywood. So let's start with coating. The top surface is just this one over here. So just the coating is the easy one. The coating is just the top surface. The top surface is just the surface area of this one up here. How long is this one? Well, this one is four because this down here, this area and this area, this length and this length are the same. And this is 1.5. So the surface area of this rectangle is four times 1.5, which is six. So that's six um, square inches of plywood. Now, I'm sorry, of coating. Now we need the plywood. Now the plywood is all the other sections. How many sections are there? Where there's the ramp itself, then there's this side of the ramp, that side of the ramp, the bottom of the ramp, and the outside of the ramp. So there's one, two, three, in the back, four, or five. So it looks like five of them. Okay. Let's start with the easy ones. Let's start with the bottom, which is the bottom one over here. Well, the bottom over there is 12 times 4. So the bottom, so that's the first one. 12 times 4 is 48. Okay. Um, now let's try the the back. The back is 4 by 2. It looks like. Again, because it's this one, which is the same as this. So it's 4 times 2. Whoops. Is 8. Now, we've got the inside and the outside, which are going to be the same. In other words, it's going to be two of the same. This trapezoid and this trapezoid are going to be the same. There's going to be two of them. Now with a trapezoid, you got to figure out the average base times the height. 
So for the trapezoid, what's the average base? Well, it looks like the top base is 1.5 and the bottom base is 12. So the average between 12 and 1.5 would be, I guess, 6.75, I imagine. Yeah, 12 plus 1.5 is 13 and a half. 13, 6.75, right? Okay. So the average base is uh, is 6.75, and the height is 2 of both ones. So 6.75 times 2, which is 13.5, and there's two of them this side and that side, 0.5. And we've got one more, and that's the ramp itself. The ramp itself is this area. And, hmm, the ramp itself is an interesting one. The ramp itself, we've got to figure out, let's, let me, let me put the, let me erase all this stuff and get a new, get a new diagram here. And make this a little bigger, because this is going to be a little more complicated. So f f to figure out the ramp, we need this line multiplied by this line. Well, the bottom one, of course, is easy. That's 4. We need to figure out what this is. Now, this is actually a diagonal. So we can, I guess we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure that out. Hmm, this is an interesting one. I'm going to draw a line down here. And let's see if we can use that. Yeah, this makes sense, actually. This is a hard one. Um, this height, of course, would be 2, because it's the same as this. This length well, would be the entire minus the 1.5. It's the 12, which is the whole bottom, minus the 1.5, which was this area. So this one would be actually 9.5. Now we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what this diagonal would be. Uh, the diagonal would be... Let's say 2 squared plus 9.5 squared equals c squared. And I'm going to take out the calculator here. OK, 9.5 squared is 90.25 plus 2 squared, which is 4, equals 94.25. Let's take the square root of that to plug it into the Pythagorean theorem, and we've got 9.71. So we're going to estimate this thing as 9.71. And of course, this side is the same, nine, also 9.71. So this whole area over here would be the width, which is 4, times 9.71. So. We've still got the 9.71 on the calculator, so while we're here, let's just multiply it by 4. We've got 38.83 equals 38.83. Now, if we add all these up, we should get the total amount of plywood necessary. We've got 48, point, 48 plus 8 is 56. 13.5 times 2 is 27. So 56 plus 27 is 83. And then 83 plus 38.83 is, um, Again, I guess the process is the important thing over here. It was a pretty hard question, but I guess if you just draw, you can draw as many of these imaginary lines as you like uh, in order to figure out the ultimate answer. Homework number five, which continues with angles, measurements of angles, and, well, stuff like that. This is question number one for homework number five, and that is in the figure shown below. AC is uh, congruent, which means equal in this context, to BE. So let's mark this with a tick, and BE with a, excuse me, uh, AC is CE, which is this whole Thing, basically this whole line over here, okay. And BD is e congruent to BE. BD is congruent to BE. Okay. So these two are isosceles triangles. This little triangle over here and the big triangle AEC. And AE is congruent to DE. AE, actually let's use, let's use double ticks for this. And AE is congruent to DE. So we'll use triple ticks 
for this. Huh, so we've got a lot of congruent triangles here. Uh, okay. AED is 105. So where's AED? AED. So this whole angle over here is 105 degrees. Find the measures of AEC. AEC, that's this one over here. We'll call that angle 1 because that's the one we're looking for. And CAB. CAB is angle number 2. Okay, and here I've taken the liberty of making the figure a little bit bigger. Now, the key thing, of course, with this sort of thing is that when you have an isosceles triangle, the bases are equal. So before we even figure out any of these things, I'm going to figure see what we can do to figure out uh, what the what some of the other measurements are because of what I always do with these things is just try to look at what can you fill in and then hopefully it'll eventually fill in what you need. All right. Now this is 105 degrees. So that means this big triangle AED, of course all triangles have to equal 180 altogether. Now this angle over here EAB and this angle over here BDE have to be equal because those are the bases of an isosceles triangle. This big triangle ADE is isosceles and since this is equal to this, these two base angles have to be equal. And this one up here was 105, which means there's only 75 degrees left between the two bases. And so each one of them is going to be half of 75, and half of 75 is, of course, 37.5. So I'm going to write 37.5, and so I'm going to put those over here, a 37.5 here and a 37.5 there for this whole big triangle. Okay, now is there anything else that we can figure out? Well, the thing that strikes me right away is what about this triangle, BED? We know that BE is equal to BD. So that means these two base angles, this one and this one, have to be equal. So I'm going to take that 37.5 and put another one right over here. Okay, see this is helpful because that's the base angle of, base two angles of this triangle over here. Now we know that this whole thing, this whole angle one, is 105 total. So we know that this whole angle, AED, is 105, because we were told that, and this part of it is 37.5, which means the other part, BEA, or CEA, or AEC, which happens to be one of the ones that we're looking for, has to be 105 minus 37.5. Now, 105 minus 37.5, so that has to be, angle 1 has to be 67.5, because that's 105 minus 37, so I'm just going to put in uh, 67.5, and we'll move this over here. So that's part of our answer. So already we got uh, 67.5 for this one. Um, now, if just out of curiosity, I mean, again, we could probably figure out number two, but in order to do that, we can keep filling out the other angles. Well, we can figure out this one because together they have to equal 180. This is 37.5 and 67.5, so combine that's 105. So what's left over here is 75, of course. So I'm going to put a 75 here. Um, and we will put this over here. Now this, of course, has to be 105 for two different reasons. This has to be 105 because <coughs> this triangle has to be 180 altogether, and already 75 is used up by this 37 and a half and this 37 and a half, so there's only 75 left. And also because it's a linear pair, it's a supplementary angle with this one. And a linear pair, a supplementary angles have to equal 180 altogether. So this has to be 105 regardless. So I'm going to put 105 in here, and... Okay, uh, I'm going to put it over here, and also that means that this has to be 105, again for two different reasons. First of all, because it's a vertical pair with this one. Remember, when, when two lines crisscross, the angles that they make that are opposite each other have to be the same, plus it's a linear pair. It's supplementary angles with, uh, with this line, CBE, so it has to be supplementary with this one. This one is 75, so that has to be 105 to equal up to 180. 
Okay, now let's see if we can figure out, we need to figure out what this one is. How can we figure that out? Okay, well, that shouldn't be too hard. Um, we know that this is equal to this, which means that this angle, which is the base of the big triangle AEC, has to equal to this. And this, the total is 67.5. This is 37.5. So whatever is left over here has to equal out, equal up to 67.5. So it looks like angle 2 has to equal 30 in order to equal up to total of 67.5. I'm going to put that in, and that's that's our answer. So uh, you know, we could then then if we wanted to figure out this one, just out of curiosity, well, this is 165. Um, I'm sorry, this is not 60, this is 30. That's my mistake. Uh, it has to be equal 67.5 altogether, which means there are 30 left. So let's put the 30 in here, and that's that's our answer. Angle this CAB is 30, AEC is uh, 67.5. So those are our answers. And if we wanted this angle, which is the last angle that we haven't done yet, well, that should be easy enough. There are many different ways we could figure out this. We could figure it out from the big triangle ACE. This is 67 and a half. This is 67 and a half. Combined, that is 135. And so there's only 45 degrees left for this angle, so this would have to be 45. The other way we could figure it out is by this triangle, ABC, which this is 105, that's 30, that's 145, which means, 135, which means that there's 45 left. So either way, angle C would be 45. Didn't question, didn't ask us for it, but, you know, for the sake of completeness, uh, let's put this in. The, the one thing you'll notice is that once you get a few on these kinds of problems, once you get a couple of them, uh, the rest of them will not only be easy, but there'll be multiple different ways that you can figure out the angles uh, of many of the others. So now we've pretty much gotten all of the angles in these triangles, even though we weren't asked to. Question number, question number two is a similar one. The following figure GBC is 36. So where's the 36 that we're going to put in here? All right, where's the 36? Let's capture this. GBC, where G... B, C. So right over there, that guy over here is 36. And what do they want? They want GFB. Let's mark these with numbers. GFB, that's angle 1. Um, then BCE, B, C, E, it's angle 2. That's the big one here, B, C, E. That's this whole angle this angle 1, and then C, E, D. So this is angle 3. All right. Well, let's figure this out. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got some right triangles over here, which means this is 90 degrees and this is 90 degrees. And this is an isosceles triangle, F, C, E. Uh, here is a is another right triangle. Here's another right triangle. There are all sorts of uh, goodies over here that we get. So what can we figure out based on what what this being a 36? Well, the f the first thing I see is that we can work with this triangle FBC. In other words, this triangle in the middle over here, and that is this is isosceles, and because it's isosceles, the bases are equal. So this angle has to equal this angle. I'll make that a different color. And that, that should be easy enough to figure out. Now, an altitude, which is a right angle, goes to a line, bisects the top in a right triangle. So in other words, an altitude, and, I'm sorry, in an isosceles triangle. In an isosceles triangle like FBC, a, a, an altitude that goes straight up to the top and is a right angle on the bottom bisects this, which means this 36 uh, is going to apply to the other side also. Let's put a third. So let's put a another 36 up here, which is common sense. If this is going to be directly to the bottom and these two sides are equal, so this has to split it up. So this 36 and 36 is 72. Now uh, this triangle has to have 180 altogether. 
and 72 is taken up by this angle up here, FBC, which means that the bottom two each have to split up that 108 left over, which is 54. So I'm going to put a 54 um, in two places. I'm going to put a 54 over here, and I am going to put a 54 over here. So, so far we've gotten one of our answers. We've gotten uh, GFB, which is this angle over here. That's 54. So we've answered A. Now, let's see what else we can do with this. Well, interestingly, it looks, look at this shape. ECFB. That's a rhombus. Because this kind of kite, if you notice over here, this, here, 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 uh, this whole shape over here, I'll delete it as soon as I mark it up, but this whole thing over here, this kite-like structure, that is a rhombus, and in a rhombus opposite angles are equal. In fact, in any parallelogram, uh, opposite angles are equal. So this 72 means that that also has to be 72. So let's put a 72 over here. Let's get a little 72 and put a 72 over here. This has to be 72. Now if this has to be 72, then these bases have the same rules essentially. These bases also have to be uh, the 54s. For the same reason that these had to be 54s. These had to be 54s because this was 72 and it was 180 minus 72 is 108 and 108 divided by 2 is 54. I have to split them up among here. And so this one uh, has to be 54. Again, let's get two of these. One for here and one for here. Okay, good. So now we can get angle two. You know, angle two is this big one over here. You got 54 over here and 54 over here. So the whole angle two has got to be 108, right? 54 plus 54. So let's put 108 and we can get that as our answer for BCE. BCE is 108. So now we've only got one left, and that's all the way down here. Hmm, okay, well, how do we figure it out? That should be fairly simple. We can use the fact that this angle here uh, can be figured out because this was 108. This whole angle over here was 108. And this one is, is part of an ordered pier, is on a line with this. B, C, D is a line. And this angle, B, C, E, is 108. So that leaves 72 for this angle right here. Let's put a 72. Uh, let's put that over here and a 72. And based on that, we know what angle 3 is. Because like all triangles, C, E, D has to be 180 altogether. This is a right angle, so it's 90. This is a 72. So that makes uh, 90 plus 72 is 162, which means that angle 3, there's only 18 degrees left for angle 3. So we're going to put an angle. So 18 degrees is over here. And which means we can answer this by putting this up here. Uh, this one over here, angle 1, was the 54. So those are our answers. And the, the problem like this looks pretty intimidating when you look at it at first because there are a lot of angles. And you know sometimes you make the mistake of thinking you got to have a strategy. You know you got to figure out like how are we going to do it. The truth is you don't need a strategy. All you need to do is just put down what you have and just figure out what you can figure out. As long as you figure, it doesn't don't even worry about the one that you have to get. As you get them, they'll all come into place. As you get them one after another, you just keep filling in, filling in, filling in. Eventually, you'll figure out the one that you need. Uh, you know, ABF, of course, is going to be the same. It's going to have all the same rules. This angle would be 72. This angle would be 90. This angle would be 18. And this whole big shape would work. There, are, there are many other ways, by the way, you could figure this out as well. The entire, the entire uh, um, shape A B D E would be a rectangle, which means if this is 90, that's 90, that's 90, that's 90. 36 and 36 is 72, which leaves 18 over here. 
the, over here. That also leaves 18. Many different reasons why this has to, why why these angles are gonna are gonna work. The next one is a proof. A proof you do by a statements and reasons column. In fact, I'm gonna open up a Word file over here in order to in order to do the proof. All right, uh, I'm gonna open it over here, and what I'm gonna do is, is I'm going to put in a um, a column. I'm sorry, a a table, and I'm gonna put in a statements column and a reasons column. So you know what, let's put it on our Word file here. Just uh we got our diagram over here. Let's well we'll we'll go we'll go back and forth over here. A C is congruent to B C. That's the big line over here. Whoops. Okay, A C is congruent to B C. These two lines are equal to each other. A F is congruent to BF. Prove that triangle EBC, EBC, this one here, is congruent to DAC, DAC. In other words, this triangle is congruent to this triangle. Now remember, in order to get a uh, to prove two, congr two triangles congruent, you can do it by proving all three sides are equal to the all, all three sides. SSS is congruent to SSS, all three sides together. You can do two angles on a side, or you can do two sides and the angle in between them. That's, of course, part of the fundamental idea, but that's really your three opportunities. Two angles and a side are equal to the other, other triangles, two angles and a side, all three sides equal to all three sides, or SAS, side angle side, consecutively, are equal to the other triangles, side angle side. Now in these two triangles, you really kind of start off with, with two of them here. Uh, what do you start off with? Remember, we're talking about this triangle here, um, and this triangle here, these two triangles. Now, you really start off with two things because they gave you one of the sides. They gave you AC and BC. They gave you that right away. Now, angle they have a common angle, which is angle C. Angle C is an angle in both of them, so obviously an angle is equal to itself. So the only thing we need left is one angle or one side. Now it seems to me we can do that relatively easily by getting this angle and this angle. If we do that, if we get this angle, well now we've got angle side angle. We've got this angle is equal to itself, this side is equal to this side, and this angle is equal to this angle. How can we get this angle and this angle? Well, because of these two sides are equal, the whole angle A has to be equal to the whole angle B because base angles of isosceles triangles are equal to each other. Then the little angles here and here, FAB and FBA are equal. And so therefore, what's remaining has to be equal as well. So how would I prove that from a, from a perspective of putting that into statements and reasons? Okay, I'm going to put this over here while we work on it here. So let's take a let's look at it. So our first statement, uh, you can you should really say that you know say the givens also. So we'll say AC is equal to BC segment AC, and because it's given, okay, that's e easy enough. Number two, we've got AF is equal to is is congruent to BF. is equal to BF, again, given. Now, we've got two different triangles again. We're looking for this triangle, and we're looking for this triangle. So we've got one angle <coughs> that's, com that's common, and that's angle C. So I'm going to say angle C. I'm going to use this symbol for angle. Angle C is equal to angle C. 
Well, because angles are equal to themselves. That's simple enough. Okay, so now we've got one. Now we need two of the sides of the big triangles of E, B, C, and A, D, A, C, which is this, and we've got them. We've got side A, C. Well, we don't even have to write again A, C is equal to B, C, because we already wrote it. It's already given. So that's two. Now let's look at the base angles. So let's try angle C, A, B. Angle C, A, B is equal to... You can, by the way, if you want to give them numbers, you can give them numbers and, and do it that way. It's, it's a little easier, but I'll use the full angle names. Is equal to uh, ABC, to angle ABC, because base angles of isosceles... triangles are equal, and these are obviously base angles. Now, we're also going to do the, these two little angles, the green one. We'll say angle, oh, let's just copy and paste this and change the letters to make it a little bit easier. FAB, call it FAB, is equal to ABF, or Okay, again, because this is this is a, an isosceles triangle, AFB, so we'll do the same. Base angles of isosceles triangles are equal. Then we'll get to the next thing over here, to the, to the orange ones. We'll say CAD. Whoops. Okay, CAD this time. This one is equal to... EBC, which is this one, in other words, the orange angles. And I'm not even sure how to describe this, honestly. You know, may, I don't know if this is an actual theorem or a postulate, so I'm just going to write it in plain English. <laughs> I'm going to say, um, since the big angles and The, you know, the big angles are equal to each other, and the, uh, the green angles are equal to each other. FAB is equal to that. The remaining parts of the two angles must be equal to each other. Again, there's, prob there's probably some sort of a theorem or postulate there, but just you know, to me it just seems like common sense. It seems fairly obvious that if the whole angle is equal, and this whole angle is equal, and the greens are equal to each other, then whatever's left over of the oranges has to be equal to each other. Well, now we've got an angle of this and a side and an angle. So then I'm going to say triangle, and I don't have a triangle symbol here, so I'm just going to actually type out triangle. E... B, C, and I should really use the congruent sign over here, but I don't have the congruent sign over here, so I'm just going to use the equal sign over here. If you're writing it out, you should use the triangle, the congruent sign with the little squiggly thing on top of the equal sign. D, A, C, and for this one I'm going to say A, S, A is congruent to A, S, A. Angle, side, angle is congruent to angle, side, angle, which it is. Angle, side, angle to angle, side, angle. So these two are congruent to each other. Okay, number six, another proof. In fact, the last three of these, or I'm sorry, number five. Well, this is actually number six. So I, I, I copied and pasted it out of order. We can do that. That's no problem. We'll do number six, and then number five, and then number seven. AB is perpendicular to BC. Okay, that means this makes a right angle. Uh, DC is perpendicular to BC. This makes a right angle. Okay, simple enough. And AB is congruent to CD. So this equals that. Prove that angle BAC, BAC, this one over here, I'll make the one that we have to prove green, to this one, CBD. Okay? So let's figure out how we're going to do this. Now, 
In order to do that, the simplest way that I can see would be to get two of these triangles to be congruent to each other and then use corresponding parts. Corresponding parts is after you establish that triangles are congruent to each other, then the everything in the triangles, all the angles and sides, have to be equal to each other. The corresponding parts of each ones have to be equal to each other. So let us take a look at this. Um, so how are we going to do that? We've got two sides to either the, the little triangles or the big triangles like A, C, B, and D, B, C. We can use the big triangles or the little triangles. Let's see which one we have. Well, I can see right away that we've got the big triangles very, very easily. In other words, B, C, D, this triangle, and A, C, B, looks like we have very, very easily over here because they're already giving us one of the angles and one of the sides. They gave us this side to this side and this angle to this angle. And this one, this side, BC, is common to both of them. This side over here is congruent to itself. And that's going to give us the two big triangles. And once you get the two big triangles, just you know, use corresponding parts. That's simple enough. So, uh, so it, it seems to me that this is actually a very easy proof. So let's see how to go about putting it together in uh, in plain English. Now, uh, this is the one we were using last last time. So I'm going to take out all the uh, take out all the videos. Um, take, I'm sorry, take out all the statements. So in this one, we had AB is perpendicular. Oh, you, you usually use the perpendicular symbol, but again, uh, it's probably somewhere over here. Okay, I can't find the symbol, although I'm sure it's somewhere. Anyway, AC is per AB is perpendicular to BC because it's given. And also we had what else? DC and BC. Yeah, same thing. DC and BC. And we were given AB is equal to CD and that was also given. Okay. Whoops. Fine. Okay, so then we proved very simply that ABC and DCB are right angles. We'll say that. Angle ABC and angle B, C, D, this one and this one are right angles because perpendicular lines form or meet at right angles. Again, there may be a more precise scientific w w mathematical way of putting that, but that's fine. Right angles, not tight angles. And then we will say that these two are equal to each other. <laughs> Which may be fairly obvious, but we should say it. We should say that these two angles equal to each other because perpendicular angles are equal to each other. They're all 90 degrees. Again, fairly obvious, but in proofs you want to make things as clear as possible. And then, so we've got a side, we've got an angle, now we get the last side. BC is equal to BC <laughs> because uh, line segments, you can call them sides if you want, are equal to themselves, fairly obvious. Then we've got the two triangles. Then we've got triangle ABC is congruent, again, I'm just using the equal symbol, but you should really use the congruent symbol, is congruent to triangle uh, BCD because side angle side, so we'll say SAS is congruent to SAS, side angle side is congruent to side angle side. And then finally, our last, our, the thing that we're trying to prove, we're trying to prove that uh, BAC is equal to, I'll copy and paste this to make it a little easier, BAC, which is the thing we're trying to prove, is equal to uh, CBD. Which is, and the reason is, is because corresponding parts of congruent triangles 
are equal. Notice if, these, if this triangle is congruent to this triangle, so their corresponding parts, which clearly this angle and this angle do correspond to each other uh, in the triangle, are equal to each other. So there we go. And then we've we've proven our we've proven our case. Congratulations. Okay, so that is question number six. Now let's go to question number five, which we skipped, but now we'll do it. And there it is. Let's make it a little smaller so we can see it. In figure, in this figure, ACDF is a parallelogram. ACDF, ACDF is a parallelogram, and AD and BE bisect each other. Okay, and we need to prove over here that BC is equal to FE. All right, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. All right. So BC is congruent to FE is what we're looking for. BC and FE, these two over here. Just looking at it offhand, it looks to me like corresponding parts of this triangle, AFE and BCD, is going to be our best bet. But let's see what we're given. OK, we're given this as a parallelogram. Now, parallelogram, first of all, that means that opposite sides are equal. So this is equal to this. It also means that the whole bottom is equal to the whole top. This this all across, and we'll indicate it like this. Okay, and we're also given that um, AD and BE bisect each other. They each one is half. So, for example, this, uh, you know, I'll use one red tick. This is equal to this, and for two red ticks, this is equal to this because they bisect each other. They split each other in half. All right, prove that BC is congruent to FE. These two parts over here. OK. Now, in a parallelogram, opposite angles are equal as well. So we know that this is going to be equal to this. OK. So we've already got a side and an angle. We've already got this side, and again this side, and this angle and this angle. Now the third side, let's see how we would get that. I mean, you know, honestly, I'm just thinking of how we could get that. I see an easy way to get this side and this side, AE and BD, because these two triangles, this triangle and this triangle, we can prove congruent right away based on side angle side because this is this here this and this and this are the two sides and this angle of course has to be equal to this angle because they're vertical angles they're a vertical pair of angles so i can see that these two triangles are going to be congruent to each other right away which would allow us to get this side and this side but that wouldn't end the inquiry that wouldn't give us the final uh tally because then you just have side side angle and side side angle is not good enough um, if the angle isn't between the two sides that you're that you're working on, a different tact might be, and I'll use a different color. I'm just thinking out loud over here. A different tact might be now opposite sides of a parallelogram are also parallel to each other. We can use this and this as being parallel to each other, and then so therefore we can say that this angle equals this angle as alternate interior angles. Um, now, based on the alternate, because this is, you know, it's bisected by one transversal. AD is a transversal that bisects, uh, that, that intersects the two parallel lines, AF and CD. So once we do that, then we can show that this angle, uh, EAG, is equal to that angle. ADB because of corresponding parts of this middle triangle over these middle triangles over here. And then <laughs> um, we can get these two angles. This is probably a little convoluted. We can get these two angles, the blue ones, um, because of 
because the, the two big angles are equal, so the smaller parts, like we did in the last one, and then we can get the out, then we can get these triangles based on uh, an SA, um, ASA, angle side angle, or SAS, angle side angle side, and then we can get these based on corresponding parts. Uh, now, there's probably a better way. I'm thinking of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, there's probably a much simpler way that I'm just missing. Maybe if you're looking at it for a little while, you can figure it out. You can figure out what I'm, you know, what I'm doing wrong, but uh, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna do it the long way here. Why not? You know. So let's start our proof over again. This is gonna be a little bit longer than the other one, but that's okay. We've got we have time, <laughs> I guess. I have time anyway. I don't know about you. All right, but you know this should should be instructive one way or the other. So A B C. Uh, so what do we have? We've got A C D F is a parallelogram because given okay and ad and uh, be bisect each other also given so what's our next step now what we did next is we got the interior okay so we got the interior angles we got the interior triangles excuse me i'll say eg and bg eg equals bg because um, ad bisects um, ad bisects be in other words this bisects this leaving two equal segments again it's not very mathematically precise but it will do uh, then we'll do the same with B. Then we'll do the same with AG and AD. And GD. AG equals GD. And we'll use the same reasoning, except this time we'll say that BE bisects AD, leaving two equal segments. Fine. So now we've got the middle. Then we've got these two angles. We'll say angle AGE. Angle AGE equals angle BGD because pairs of vertical angles are equal to each other, which means this if you cr if you crisscross two diagonals, crisscross two uh Segments, the op ang opposite, the angles opposite of each other will inherently be equal to each other. They're called vertical angles. Okay, now we've got the two triangles. Now we've got triangle, and this is AGE is congruent. I'll use equal, but again, it should be congruent to triangle BGD because of SAS. This side, this side, and this angle, and this side. So we got SAS is congruent to SAS. Fine. Now we wanted to use what? Now we wanted to use AE and BD because of corresponding parts. So I'll do AE is equal to BD, this one and this one, and we'll do corresponding parts. I'll just leave it as corresponding parts. You should really write corresponding parts of congruent triangles or congruent, but it's fine for now. Okay, so now we've got those, that, those two. Now, what other angle are we going to want to use? Uh, now, C and F we don't even really need because we're going to use this angle and this angle. So we don't even really need angle C and angle F, so I'm not even going to bother to mention that. I am going to say these two sides, AF is equal to CD, and I'll just say AF is equal to CD, and the reason is because opposite sides of parallelograms are equal. Now we're going to work on this angle here. So I'm going to say the two big angles, FAD, angle FAD is equal to angle ADC because they're alternate interior angles. So I'll say something like when uh, two parallel. Actually, I should I should sir, I should first say that these are parallel lines. Um, that AF 
is parallel. Let's, but we'll, we're going to use this next, so I'm just going to put this over here. So I'm going to say AF is parallel to CD because opposite sides of a parallelogram are also parallel. That's why it's called a parallelogram. So I'm going to say parallel. Then I'm going to say FAD, this angle here, the big one, is equal to this big one over here, ADC, because when two parallel lines are cut by a transversal, which just means a line that cuts both through both, uh, alternate interior angles are equal. Okay, these are alternate interiors. This and this are alternate interiors. Now we've got this one over here, the one with the three lines, this three, these, this three greens and that three greens, EAG to GEB. EAG is equal to angle GEB. This we've got based on corresponding parts of the middle of the of these two triangles, the ones that we already proved. So for this, I'm just going to say corresponding parts. Okay. Now, this is similar to what we did last time. Uh, we're going to do these two angles. We'll do FEA. Okay, I'll just copy and paste this. This is FEA and BDG. Okay, because I'll say since the big angles, FAD was equal to that, and the smaller angles, these ones over here, whoops, which were EAG is equal to GEB, the remaining parts of equal angles must be equal. This is similar to the one we did last time. Now we've got this angle, and this side, and this side. So now we can get the outer triangles, the ones that have little blue squiggles in them. And so we'll say triangle uh, AFE is equal to triangle BCD. And we will do that because of SAS, side angle side. So we'll say SAS is congruent to SAS. And finally, we've got the thing that we finally want, which was BC and FE. BC equals FE, and we've got that based on corresponding parts. So we'll just write corresponding parts of congruent triangles are equal. I bet there was an easier way to do this, <laughs> just uh, thinking about it. But uh, let's see, was there a better way? Yeah, there was actually a much easier way. Now that I think about it, I'm just looking at it. The easiest way to do this would be, instead of getting these two triangles, we could have gotten these two triangles, AGB and BGD. We could have gotten them on the same rules as we, as we did before. We could have gotten them on side angle side, side angle side, because we got this and this and this and this. Those are two sides of these interior triangles over here. Then this angle over here where the G is, then the opposite angle, of course, are verticals. So we can get these two triangles, EDG and AGB, on SAS, that they're equal to each other. Then we can get the smaller segments, AB and ED, on corresponding parts. And AC and FD, the big ones, are equal to each other because they're opposite sides of a parallelogram. And then we can get BC and FE based on the uh you know based on the remaining the remaining parts of the equal big sides. In other words, if these two the small ones are equal to each other and the whole ones are equal to each other, so the remaining parts have to be equal to each other as well. So that actually probably would have been an easier straightforward. But again, the great thing about these things is that there's no as long as you do as long as you do as long as all the steps you do are fine, that's fine. You don't get extra points for solving it in the minimum number of steps possible. Uh, so even though I solved it in a way that uh, and I proved it in a way that could have been done in a shorter way, you know the way we did it was fine. Okay, uh, let us take a look at the last one, problem number seven. Given that D. B is perpendicular to AC, 
So we're going to make this, and we're going to make a little line over here to indicate this is perpendicular, and that B is the midpoint of AC, which means this is congruent to that. Prove that ABD oh, you see, is, is congruent to CBD. This is an easy one. <laughs> this is great. Uh, <laughs> this is a lot easier than the one we just saw. Well, think about it. We've already got two of the angles. This, of course, if this is um, a 90-degree angle, this has to be a 90-degree angle. And we've got two sides because it says it's, that B is the midpoint of AC. These and this has to be equal. And this one we get on the self uh, the reflective, uh, ref I think it's called the reflexive uh, Carl, um, postulate, that things are equal to themselves. BD is equal to BD. And then we've got the two triangles on side, angle, side. Side, angle, and then a side, because they, they share a side. So this actually will be a very easy one. Uh, we'll solve this fairly quickly, hopefully. Let's go get our... Um, all right, there we go. We'll put this here with our diagram, and we will delete this. Um, let's make this a little smaller so that we can actually see it while we're doing it. All right, so what have we, what are we given? We're given that DB is perpendicular to AC because given. And B is the midpoint of AC, again, given. And that's all we're given. So let's start with uh, these two angles, A, B, D. Or let's start with the sides. A, B, doesn't matter what order you do them, is equal to B, C, because a midpoint, which is B, bisects a segment into two equal segments. Okay, that's simple enough. Then these two angles, ABD, angle ABD and angle DBC, this one over here are right angles because a perpendicular lines, well, a perpendicular line, or lines really should be, perpendicular lines meet at right angles. And then we can say they're equal to each other because they're both right angles. So I'll just put an equal sign in the middle there and we'll say right angles are equal to each other. And now we've got db and db that's simple enough db equals db or bd either way because segments are equal to themselves and now we've got a we've got side here angle here and side here and then we can just say that triangle abc is congruent to triangle cbd and this we've got based on side angle side equals, or really perpendicular to side angle side. And we've proven it, and that's pretty much it. So the other ones were a little bit harder. This one's a little bit easier. Hopefully all of them are instructive. Now for homework six, the good news is there are only two questions. And these are all about angles and calculating them. And we've, we've already done some of this uh, anyway. But let's look at this, and this is a whole bunch of them. There's 28 of them <laughs> here. Uh, this says A is parallel to B, which it, it shows, it shows in the diagram anyway. D is perpendicular to E. Where is line D and line E? Which means this is a 90 degree angle. Well, they're all 90 degree angles. All these four are 90 degree angles. Line angle 28 is 40 degrees. And la angle 8 is 60 degrees. And our, our uh, task is to find all of the other angles. <laughs> all right, well, listen, actually, this is fairly, very easy, actually, uh, because once you get a few, they all start rolling in. Now, right away, just let's, let's, let's fill them in. Well, 60, these are vertical angles. 6 and 8 are vertical angles, so this has to be 60 as well. Now, 5 is... Uh, you can get it because it's supplementary with 6, because it's on the same line, or you can get it because it's supplementary with 8. Either way, they have to equal up to 180. So this is 60, so this has to be 120. 
7 also has to be 120 for any one of three different reasons, either because it's supplementary with 8, it's on the same line, supplementary with 6, it's on the same line, or because it's equal to 5, because they're vertical angles. Okay, now let us look. Now we know that A and B are equal, which means that 9 and 7 are alternate interior angles on the same line, so we'll call that 120 as well. Uh, you know, I'm just going to put, I'll write this down here. So I'll put this All right, so we'll put this 120 over here as well. And then we've got 60s. Where's where do we put the 60s? Now the 60s, if you think about it, would have to be over here and over here there have to be a 62. I won't write them all in, but you you can see fairly obvious. 12 has to be a 60 again because either because it's supplementary with 9 or because it's supplementary with 11 or because it's equal to 10, it's vertical angles. Okay, now we can't automatically get 1 2 3 4 13 14 15 and 16, but we can based on what we have down here. Uh, let's see, what do we got? We got um, down here, we've got, these are all 90 because the, these are all supplement. These are, this is perpendicular. Line D and line E are perpendicular. So this is 90. Uh, sorry. That's 90. That's 90. That's 90. And that's 90. Okay, this 40 means that 26 is also 40 because of, per of verticals. 25, of course, is supplementary with either one, which means it's 140 because they have to equal up to 180 altogether. 27 is also 140 because it has it's either because it's supplementary with 28 or supplementary with 26 or equal to 25. Now, 20 we can get too. 20 we can get because this triangle in here has to equal up to 180. This is 90. That's 40. That's 130 altogether. So 20 has to be the remaining 50. And because 20 is 50, 18 has to be 50 also. Um, because 18 is, um, okay, so, and because 18 and 20 are 50, 19 and 17 have to be supplementary, which means 17 has to be 130 and 19 has to be 130. Now, um, well, let's see, 12, this is 120. We got 11 is 120, 10, of course, is 60 because it's supplementary with 9 or because it's supplementary with 11. 12 has to be 60, again, either because it's supplementary with 11, because it's supplementary with 9, or because it's equal to 10, either way. Now what about 15? Well, 18 is 50, 12 is 60, so that's 110. So there's 70 degrees left for 15 because of the fact that it's a triangle and a triangle's got to equal 180. 16, well, is supplementary with 15, Take away the 70, so it's 110 left. Then we've got 13, which has to be 70. Again, either because it is supplementary with 10 or because it is equal to 15. And 14, of course, has to be 110 also. Same reason. 4 is an alternate interior with 14, because A and B are parallel. So 4 has to be 110. 2 has to be 110 because it's a vertical angle with 4. And 1 and 3 have to be 70 because they are supplementary with 4, and they're both supplementary with 4 and 2. And that's it. That's all our angles. <laughs> There's a lot of them, but once you get going, it's, it's a very simple problem. Just keep filling them in. A little time-consuming, but hey, so what? Anyway, here we go. Here is another question, question number 2. Again, we got a whole lot of them over here, and we're going to fill them out one by one. Uh, let, let, let me get a bigger one over here. I'm gonna delete this and make this a, get a, get a one that's get one that's a little bit bigger here, um, in order to be able to fill them in a little bit better. All right, let's make this as big as we can make it. There we go. Okay, let's get our pen out. All right, figure number one. Excuse me, angle number one is 90. Doesn't look like a 90 degree angle, but. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, in determine whether each statement is true or false. 
Okay, well, you know, before we even look at that, let's figure let's figure out what some of them are. This is perpendicular. So this we this we know is 90. Because this is 90, well 9 has to be supplementary with this cuz it's on the same line. So 9 also has to be 90, which means 12 also has to be 90, which means that 11 and 10 together have to be 90. That doesn't help us much. Now this is parallel with this. Notice these two lines are parallel. You got these little thingamabobs over here that signify that they're parallel. So 9 and 7 are alternate interiors. So that's 90. 8 is 90. What else do we got here? We got 11 and 2 have to be equal, of course. We don't know what they are yet, but 11 and 2 have to be equal because they are the base of an isosceles triangle along with 5. Um, I guess we know, well, let's let's take a look at some of these and see if they're, if they make sense. Okay, for starters, let's look at number one, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one equals 90. Now, a one, in order for one to equal 90, these lines would have to be perpendicular. Now, they don't look perpendicular, but that, that in itself doesn't mean anything. What does mean something, however, is that if this were perpendicular, if this were 90, then this would also have to be 90 because they're an ordered pair. On this line, the two lines would have to equal 90. Now, is that possible? I think the answer is that, that it's impossible because if 2 and 11 are equal, which they are, they have to be because they're bases of an isosceles. So if 2 was 90, then 11 would have to be 92. If 2 and 11 were both 90, that would equal up to 180. It wouldn't leave any, any degrees left for 5. 5 wouldn't be able to exist because 5 would be a 0 degree angle. 2 and 11, so 1 cannot equal 90. So we know that number 1 is incorrect. Because if 1 were 90 again, then 2 would have to be 90 because they're supplementary. Which means 11 would have to be 90 because they're equal, to, is equal to 2. And that's not possible because you can't have a triangle with two right angles. You can't have a triangle with two 90 degree angles, then the third one that wouldn't exist wouldn't be anything left. How about number 1 equals uh, 5 plus 11? Well, what does 1 e 1 is alternate interior with this. 1 looks like it, you know, this, this is a transversal. This line over here cuts these two parallel lines, which means 1 is equal to 5 and 6 combined. And 6 is equal to 11, because if you notice 6 and 11 are also alternate interiors. For the same reason. This is the transversal, these are the two parallel lines. So 1 is equal to 5 plus 6, and 6 is equal to 11. So that means really 1 is equal to 5 plus 11. So we'll give that a check mark, and we can explain why, because 1 is equal to 5 and 6 because they're alternate interiors, and 6 is equal to 11, so 1 by definition has to be equal to 1 to 5 plus 11. Okay, number nine plus ten is two times is two times five. The the uh, the fifth ang the um, angle five. Well, let's see. Uh, number one. Let's take some of these lines out to make it a little less confusing. Uh, okay, what do we have? We got number nine. Number nine. Well, actually, I, I will put an X over here and a check over here. All right. Number 9, what did we figure out number 9? Number 9 is 90 degrees, plus number 10, which we don't know what it is, has to be double number 5. Uh, in other words, here's number 5, and here is number 9 and 10 combined. So does this big angle have to be double that angle? Not necessarily. I mean, it is true that this angle is alternate, that 4 and 5 combined equals 9 and 10 combined. Where is a different color? This whole angle has to equal this whole angle because they're alternate interiors. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's, double no it's double number 5. Yes, I don't see any inherent reason why 5 has to be equal. Basically, in order for 9 plus 10 to be 2 times 5, what essentially you'd be saying is that 4 is equal to 5. Because double 5 would be 5 and 4, which is the thing that 9 and 10 combined are equal to. I don't see any inherent reason. I know that it looks like 6 is definitely equal to... Well, 6 is equal to 11, and 11 is equal to 2. 
So and four is equal to two. So four, six, eleven, and twelve all do have to be equal. Eleven and six because of alternate interiors, two and four because of alternate interiors, and eleven and two because they're bases of a isosceles triangle. In fact, the truth is that the answer to that this is actually no. I just realized that it's definitely not. And the reason why it's definitely not is because if five would be equal to two and eleven, then it would be an equilateral triangle, not an isosceles triangle. It doesn't say it's an equilateral triangle, it just says it's isosceles. If it were equilateral, if, in other words, if this were also equal, then 5 would be equal to the others. Now, so if we know that 5 is not equal to 2 and 11, and we know that 2 is equal to 4, then we know that 5 is not equal to 4. Now, if 5 is not equal to 4, and this entire thing has to equal this entire thing, so we know that you cannot just double 5 in order to get the same as 9 and 10. So the answer is no. The last one is an easy one. Uh, 5 plus 6 equals 1. Well, 1 is an alternate interior with 5 and 6. So obviously the answer to that is yes. Next we have homework 7. Now homework 7 is where geometry kind of meets algebra a little bit, things get a little bit more complicated in terms of the operational numbers. Maybe less complicated than some of the uh, rules that we discussed earlier in proofs, but a little bit more complicated when it comes to numbers. So over here, question number one is find the area of the rhombus if wy is 30 centimeters. So over here, this of course is a rhombus. Now a rhombus has a few uh, rules. First of all, the diagonals are perpendicular, which means that this has to be a right angle. Uh, the diagonals also bisect each other. That's true with all parallelograms. So if wy is 30 feet, is 30, so then this has to be 15, and this part has to be 15. Uh, all the sides of a rhombus are equal. So for example, this is also x plus 9, and honestly. This is actually fairly easy. <laughs> um, the problem here is is that you have to figure out what x is. You know that the area of any parallelogram is base times the height, which is x plus nine times x plus nine. But in order to figure out what that is, we need to figure out what x is. Now, the way I would figure out what x is is by using the right uh, is by using the fact that you have these right all the all four of these are right triangles. In fact, all four of these are right triangles with the exact same dimensions. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what x is. This, of course, w x is the hypotenuse because it's opposite the right angle. So what I would do is I would say the general Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So in this case, that would be x plus 6 squared plus 15 squared equals x plus 9 squared. There might be an easier way that I'm not thinking of right now, but you'd have to figure out. Uh, you need to figure out what x is, obviously, in order to know what the area is. So then this would have to multiply out into a fairly complex algebraic uh, formula. x plus 6 is the same thing as x squared plus 12x plus uh, 36, because it's x times x, which is x squared, plus 6x plus 6x, which is 12x, uh, plus 36. Basically, that's the same thing as saying x plus 6 times x plus 6. And if you remember FOIL, x times x is x squared, x times 6 is 6x, x times 6 is 6x, which equals 12x together, plus 36, um, plus 15. 15 squared, which is 100 and 225, equals x squared. Again, same thing. You have to make this into x plus 9 times x plus 9, which is x squared plus 18x plus 81. So when you combine, you got well, the good news is the well. First of all, first let's combine. On this side, you've got x squared uh, plus 12x plus 36 and 225, which is 261, equals x squared plus 18x plus 81. Okay. Now the x squareds cancel out you wanted to get the numbers to one side and the letters to the other side. So you can subtract x squared from each side and subtract x squared from each side. So these cancel out. So the only thing you have left is x terms, which is 2x plus 261 
equals 18x plus 81. So let's subtract 2x from this side and 2x from this side and subtract 81 from this side and 81 from that side. So 261 minus 81 is 180 equals 18 minus 2 which is 16x. Divide each side by 16 to get x by itself and you have 180 divided by 16. Uh, we should probably, let's, well let's use a calculator, okay. Uh, 180 divided by 16 gets you 11 and a quarter. So we've got x equals 11.25. So each of these sides is 11.25 plus 9, which is 20.25. So the area is 20.25 squared. And for that again we'll use our calculator. So we'll do 20.25 times 20.25 and the entire area is 410.06. So that looks like the whole area. Again that it was fairly, this was a hard one because of the fact that we had to use the you know, use a lot of algebra to figure out what the numbers were, but that's essentially what you would do. You got to somehow figure out what x is before you can answer a question like this. Question number two is a little bit easier here. Find the measures of the following angles of the rhombus shown. This is 2x minus 1, that's the angle CAB, it looks like. And it's this one here, and then you got x minus 1, which is here. Well, let's figure out the relationship between these two. So, uh, so, well, they, they want C, B, D. So uh, the ones that they actually want are x, we'll call it, well, yeah, we'll call this angle A, little a, because that's what they ask for. And C, A, D, so they want little, little b here. Alright, so let's figure out what are the relationships between them. We know this is a rhombus, so first of all we know that uh, this, these a and b are parallel, c and d are parallel. So the first thing, let's use the same thing that we did last time. Last time, last question we used the fact that in a rhombus perpendicular, or the diagonals bisect each other. So this becomes a right angle. Now, just I'm thinking right here that can we get so we get can we get anything else? The answer is yes. That there are some other things we can figure out over here, and that's by virtue of the fact that the other side, the line, the all sides are parallel. AB, of course, is parallel to DC, and AD is parallel to BC. So right away, this is an alternate interior with this. So we'll call this also 2x minus 1. This angle has to be the same as that because of alternate interiors. Uh, x plus 1 has to be the same as over here. This also has to be x plus 1 up here. In other words, angle A, C, B, D has to be whatever x plus 1 is, again because of alternate interiors. And of course, uh, I just paused it for a little while and I was thinking about what to do over here and then I realized that there's a very, very simple solution that I was just overlooking. And that is that all of these triangles, for obvious reasons, you know, this triangle, this triangle, this triangle, and this triangle, have to be congruent to each other for many different reasons. And there are many different reasons why they have to be congruent to each other. The first one is, is side angle side. Uh, this middle, of course, has to be a right angle for all four, and then this side has to be equal to this side because of uh, because diagonals bisect each other, and that's true with all um, with all uh, parallelograms. So that's true for here as well. So based on that, we could get all of these angles, all these little angles, based on corresponding parts. If this is two x minus one and, or if, if, I'm sorry, yeah, th all these have to be equal to each other. So if this is equal to 2x minus 1, and this is the, then this has to correspond to this side. So this would also be 2x minus 1, and this would also be x plus 1, and this would also be, um, 
x plus 1, and this would also be 2x minus 1. In other words, all the angles that correspond to each other have to be the same. So based on that, we know that this plus this has to equal 90. Since this is 90, the other two combined also have to equal 90. So let's set up our basic equation saying x, 2x minus 1 plus x plus 1 equals 90. And to do that, we simply do 2x plus x is 3x. Uh, negative 1 and plus 1 cancels out. So 3x is 90. So x is 30. Um, so based on that, it looks like the 2x minus 1 angles would be 59. And so these would all be the 2x minus 1 angles would be 59, and the x plus 1 angles would be 31. So the CBD was the, in x plus 1 angles, that would be 31 degrees, and CAD would be a 2x minus 1 angle, would be 59 degrees. Okay, so let's take a look at question number three over here on homework um, seven. Okay, find the area of isosceles trapezoid below, round to the nearest hundredth. Okay, well, that's easy. The area of an isosceles trapezoid. Now, the isosceles, of course, means that the two sides are equal, so four point, this side would also be 4.3. So it's the average base times the height. Any quadrilateral is base times so like a parallelogram, rectangle, whatever, always base times height. So over here, for a trapezoid, you'd have to do the average base times the height. Now the height is, of course, 4. Uh, no, actually, the height is not 4.3. The, uh, the diagonals are 4.3, so we have to figure out what the height is. We don't know exactly what the height is. So let's make two lines over here. Maybe we can figure it out using the Pythagorean theorem. Well, if this is 10.4, then so in between these two lines, since these, I didn't draw them very well, but since they're, if they're exactly up and down, of course, this would have to be 6 over here. And so it's because this was 10.4, there'd have to be 2.2 on either side. It'd have to be 4.4 left. So this would have to be 2.2, and this would have to be 2.2. So now let's figure out the height. And the height, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. Since this is going straight down, this is a right angle. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem, which of course is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So a squared we'll call 2.2 squared plus b squared, which we don't know equals 4.3 squared. 4.3 is the hypotenuse. So I'm just going to do on my little calculator here, 2.2 squared is 4.84 plus b squared equals 4.3 squared is 18.49. Okay, so then we have to subtract the 14, the 4.84 from either side to isolate the b. And we've got b squared equals 13.65. So now we just need the square root of that, and we figured out what b is. Thankfully, we can round to the nearest hundredth. Uh, OK, whoops. Uh, let's see, 13.65 square root of that is 3.69, we'll round to the nearest hundredth, so b equals 3.69. So now we know what the height is. We know that the height is 3.69. Now we need the average base. The average, well, the bottom base was 10.4 and the top base is 6, is 6, so to get the average, add them together, which is 16.4, divide by 2 in order to get the average, and that turns into 8.2. So the base the average base is uh, 8.2, and multiply them together. So we already had 3.69. Let's multiply it by 8.2, and we get 30.30. .30. 
which means that the area of the base is 30.3 or 30.30 is the area of the entire isosceles trapezoid. Again, that's what we needed to do. We just needed to figure out the height, and you can always drop these uh, altitudes down in order to be able to figure it out. Question number four. Okay, determine if each statement is true if ABCD is a parallelogram and a rhombus. Okay, well, let's see. AD, which is this line perpendicular to CB, that's true if it's a rhombus but not necessarily true if it's a parallelogram. Remember, a parallel, parallelogram diagonals bisect each other, but they are not necessarily perpendicular. So for a parallelogram, no. And for a rhombus, yes, because, and I won't write it out, but because in a rhombus, diagonals are perpendicular to each other. Simple enough. Okay. AEC is congruent to BED. AEC angle, AEC is perpendicular to A, E, B. Again, same thing. If this is a rhombus, if this is a parallelogram, well, not necessarily. They're supplementary to each other. They're, they're, they have to equal to 180, but they're not necessarily equal. But if it's a rhombus, the answer is yes, because they're 90. If they're, if the, if it's, if they're both 90 degrees, if it's a rhombus, then obviously they have to be uh, equal to each other. They have to be congruent to each other. AEC and AEB. Let's use a different color for C. AEC, that's this, and AE... I'm sorry, I, that, that's, that's, I'm sorry that, I made the mistake. So that's, that was for number three. What's BED? BED, well that of course is for both. So this this actually answer was for this. For B, the answer is for both, because it doesn't really matter what the shape is. They're vertical angles. They're op you know, in any two angles that are crisscrossed by you know by two intersecting lines, opposite angles are vertical angles, which means that they're they're equal regardless. Doesn't matter what the shape is. Rhombus, parallelogram, nothing, trapezoid, circle, square, whatever makes no difference. These two lines that are crisscrossing each other, the opposite angles have to be equal to each other. And finally, CEA. CEA, which is the same one, okay, and BEA, BEA, same thing. It's, it's just really the same thing as the previous question. I don't, they just wrote them differently for some reason. That's kind of bizarre. But anyway, so that's a fairly simple question. So we can move on to the next question. And the next question is as follows similar type of question. Determine if each statement is true if PQRS is a rectangle or a square. All right, let us take a look. PR and is perpendicular to SQ. Well, PR is, is not necessarily true with a rectangle. If it's a rectangle, it is not necessarily true. But if it's a square, it is, because remember, a square is a type of rhombus. So in a square, the diagonals do, are perpendicular with each other. So yes, if this is a square, this becomes a right angle, they all become right angles. Because a square is a type of rhombus, and in a rhombus, diagonals are perpendicular to each other. Okay, STP and QTR. STP, that's this, and Q, T, R, this, true regardless, again, same thing, because they're vertical angles, always going to be true. STP is 90 degrees, STP, again, only if it's a square, because diagonals are perpendicular. If it's a rhombus, I'm sorry, if it is a rectangle, no. And, okay, Q, P, T. Q, P, T, okay, this angle, and equal S, R, T. And the answer, of course, is yes in both cases, because both rhombuses, both rectangles and squares are types of parallelograms, which means that regardless of whether it's a rectangle or a square, this is parallel to this. Now, if this is parallel to this, then these two angles 
are alternate interior angles. And so therefore they are equal to each other. And that is all for homework number seven. Okay, homework number eight is where we are now. And we are going to look at uh, homework number eight. Now this is chapter six in the book. And the first question, this is all about similarity of triangles. Uh, and the first rule is a, the first question is a question about the law of signs. Or the question, the basically it's just a general rule regarding a uh, any triangle. And the rule in any triangle is the sine of A over A is the same ratio as the sine of B over B equals the sine of C over C. Now in general what sine is, it's really a trigonometric term and the sine is the ratio of the opposite side of a triangle over the hypotenuse of a triangle. That of course only works with right triangles because right triangles are the only ones that have hypotenuses but in this case of course there is no hypotenuse. Nevertheless the the sine, which is a given number, it's something that you don't have to memorize, it's something that a calculator will tell you. Um, I is, I'm just gonna you know, take this off over here to give us a little bit more room to operate but in general, in order, a, a sine is a property of an angle. You know, a sine of 30 degrees is a certain is a certain number. These are constant numbers that apply to all triangles. So let us take a look at what this says over here. ABC angle A is 50 degrees. So I'll put a 50 degrees over here. A is 10. That's the length. C is 12. And now they want the rest. They want the angle B, they want angle C, and they want side B. Okay, they want, uh, yes, yeah, side B. Okay, so let's take, this should be a fairly simple example because it's the rule of signs. So the first thing we can do is we can get the rule of signs for, to get this one. Once we get this one, then B will follow. So let's take a look at how we would get the sine of C. Now, in, as the rule of signs is that sine of A is to A, as sine of C in this case, because we're looking for the angle of C, is to C. Well, okay, first of all, what is the sine of A? Well, A is 50 degrees. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, let's take a calculator. Any kind of calculator will get this for you. So this this is a particular calendar app that I, or calculator app that I have over here that will allow us to figure out the sine. And this is the sine of 50, so I'm gonna put in 50, and over here, I'm just going to click this, and the sign is 0.77. You can see I was practicing before I put on the video, so uh, the, the 0.77 was already there. Anyway, the sine of A is 0.77 is to A, side A is 10, equals sine C, and we don't know what sine C is, so for the time being, let's just leave it as X is to 12. And let's use the, do this as we would an ordinary equation, 0.77 times 12, which is, well, let's do it on the calculator, times 12 is 9.19. You cross multiply, whenever you have something like this, you just cross multiply. 10 times x is 10x equals uh, 9.19. Divide each side by 10, and you have x equals point nine one nine. Now I just in order to find out what angle that is, and obviously you would have to be given this on a test, you'd have to be given a chart. There are lots of different charts that this this I just one I randomly searched for and sign and found the sine cosine tangent chart. And I looked up the point nine one nine looks like it's in between sixty six degrees and sixty seven degrees. Point, 67 degrees is point 0.92. So I'm going to round it off. You know, we can round it off. So it's so angle C is about 67 degrees. I'm going to put that uh, over here. I'm going to put that as 67 degrees. Well, now we can figure out what B is, right? That's pretty easy. We know that a triangle has to have 180 degrees altogether. So B and C together are 117, the 67 and 50. And that means, well, it's 180. B has to be 180 minus uh, 17, oh, excuse me, minus 117, which of course is 63. Okay, so now we've got two of the things they want, and the last thing they want is side B, and this we can use the ratio of 
sine b is to b as either we can use a or c. I'm just going to use sine a because it's a smaller number. Maybe it'll be a little bit easier. But either way, so sine b, which we don't know what it is, so we're going to call, I'm sorry, sine b, we do know what it is. So b is 63 degrees. So let's take out our calculator and find sine of 63 degrees is 0.89. So we'll put a point eight nine is to b and we don't know what b is so we'll just call it b it's a variable and the sine of a we already figured out before was 0.77 is to a was 10 so cross multiply 0.77 times b equals 8.89 times 10 which is 8.9 and then isolate b by dividing each side by 0.77 and let's whip out our little calculator once again and so we've got 8.9 divided by 0.77, which is 11.56. So we've got B equals 11.56. And now we have solved the problem. We've gone, well, they, they say to, rob, to round to the nearest tenth. So it's actually 11.6. So we'll call B. 11.6, that's rounded to the nearest tenth, and now we've got all the answers that they were looking for. Question two is a little bit simpler, and it says that a map uses a scale of one centimeter for each five kilometers. Okay, let's write that down. Important to write these things down. One centimeter equals five kilometers. Looks like some sort of proportion problem. If a distance on the city map from city A to city B Okay, let's draw us on a map. City A to City B is 17.5 centimeters. What's the actual difference in kilometers? Well, this is easy enough because it tells us what the ratio is. The ratio is, uh, let's see, we've got five, one is to five. In other words, seven is the kilometer, the scale. Actually, well, you know, this is, really one is to uh, one centimeter okay as long as we use the same you know we can use the same ratios as long as we keep them the same so one centimeter is to five kilometers as 17.5 centimeters is to X kilometers we don't know how many well that's simple enough just you know cross multiply X times one is X five, uh, five times 17.5 is if that's 87.5, yeah, because 5 times 17 is 85. Okay, so that's 87.5. So the answer, of course, is that it's 87.5 kilometers. So we've got the first half. That's the easy part. Now let us look at the miles. They want the number of miles. Uh, there are 2.5 centimeters in an inch and 5,280 feet in a mile. So what's that ratio? So let's use the same basic scale as we used over here. We had one centimeter equals five kilometers. Well, you know, there are more complicated ways to do this, but I'm just going to give you the simplest way. And it's a little bit of a memorization, but it's the kind of thing you might want to memorize anyway. And that is, in general, one mile is approximately 1.61 kilometers. That's generally the conversion. I guess you could round it off to 1.6. So if you have the number of kilometers and you want to figure out the number of miles, you simply divide by 1.61. So if we take out our calculator once again and we take our number of kilometers, which was 87.5, and we will divide by 1.61. Again, if you forget the 1.61, you can use 1.6. It'll probably give you pretty close. 54.35. So the miles would be about 54.35 miles. The next question involves similar triangles. Now, images of triangles are similar, which means they don't have the same dimensions, but they have the same proportions. 
For example, in similar triangles, if one side is 3 and the corresponding side is 6, that means all the sides on the 6 will be double all the sides on the 3. So let's take a look at this example over here. Principle of a box camera is taking, taking a picture is below. The rays of light from object AB, which is the tree over here, passing through opening L form an inverted image AB. How far the, from the 30-foot tree, so we're going to say this tree is 30 feet high, must, um, from, uh, must, how far can, must, from L must be placed to produce a 4-inch image, so this is 4 inches, this is actually 30 feet, and this is 4 inches, um, of the film if the film is 8 inches behind L. So this distance here, which is where the image is, is 8. Hmm, okay. Well, this simply looks like a proportion. Since these triangles are similar, the altitude of these images, in other words, the distance, will be similar as well, which means the ratio will be the same. So on this side, we don't know how long this is, so we'll call this x is to 30. has to be similar to this side. The x is comparable to the 8, so we'll put the 8 over here, and this is a 4. Now, it's true, this is feet and this is inches, but it doesn't really matter. It's the same proportion. So let's just, you know, solve this equation. Very simple. Cross multiply. 4 times x is 4x. 8 times uh, 30 is 240. Divide each side by 4, and x equals 60. So in other words, this has to be 60 feet away, which is, you know, common sense. If this is going to be twice as far as the height is, well then this also should be twice as far as the height is. So this one would be 60. Next question is question number four. A vertical beam of searchlight, S, uh, illuminates a cloud at, at P. An observer at Q stands 100 feet from S and, and measures the angle of elevation at 82 degrees. Okay, now first of all, this is a vertical beam. It's directly up. So what do we know about this? That has to be a right angle. It goes directly up at 90 degrees. Frankly, it really pretty much gives you everything you need to know. So what do they want? They want high. how high is the cloud. So they want from here to here. So that's x. This is actually a right triangle, so this really makes it extremely easy. Uh, the They give you this angle here, and... The ratio, so what are you, what are you looking for? Well, the, the ratio is the opposite side over the adjacent side. The hypotenuse is not involved. Now, if you recall, there are three types of relationships. There's the sine of an angle is the opposite over the hypotenuse. The adjacent, I'm sorry, the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. So Katoa, as you may have remembered from high school. So... Uh, to, uh, uh, the sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent opposite over adjacent. So if we figure out what the tangent, which is the one we're going to use, the opposite over adjacent, because those are the two we have. You know, we don't have the hypotenuse, so we can't use that. Well, let's just figure out what the tangent of 82 degrees is. That should be easy enough. Let's get out our calculator. That we we're gonna so we'll put in 82 and click the tangent button 7.12 okay so our 7.12 is the opposite which is the x over the adjacent which is 100 well you can just stick this over one cross multiply and you have, well, x times 1 is x, and 7.12 times 100 is 712. So the height of this cloud is 712 feet. And that's all there is to it, just a regular tangent problem. Number four. Uh, 5 is an interesting one. This is, again, a similar triangle problem. You got two right triangles here on either side. They say a wire is strung between two posts as shown. What is the length of wire needed from A to B to C to D? All of these here to here to here. What's the length of all this 
you know, cut up wire over here. Okay, a couple of things. First of all, this first triangle is really easy because this first triangle is simply the Pythagorean theorem. Now for this triangle, remember we have this and we have this, we just need the hypotenuse, a plus b plus c. Now I can tell you right now it's going to be 13 because I recognize this is a special type of right triangle. It's a 5, 12, 13 triangle. There are a few ratios that where the hypotenuse comes out even. Uh, 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, uh, 13, I think 8, 15, 17 is the other. But just to make sure, let's do it on paper. 5 squared plus 12 squared equals x squared because we're looking for this. 5 squared is 25, 12 squared is 144 equals x squared, which is 169 equals over divided by x uh, equals x squared. Take the square root of each side to isolate the x. Square root of 169 is 13. Okay, so this is 13. That part was easy. Now, if you notice on this side, this triangle is similar to that triangle. Remember to establish similarities of triangles all you need is to have two angles that equal each other because if you have two angles that equal each other you have to have the third angles that equal each other because they all have to equal up to 180 altogether now here it says that angle A equals angle D here and here now these two angles are equal because this is perpendicular so that's a right angle and that's a right angle so they've got two equal angles this is equal to this and this is equal to this so that by definition has to be equal to that now the sides of similar triangles are in proportion. So if we want this one, all we got to do is take this ratio to this as that is to that. So if we take 5 is to 13 as 7.5 is to x. See why that is? The ratios of similar triangles have to be in proportion. So this angle is comparable to that angle. I'm sorry, this side is comparable to that side. And the hypotenuse is the one that is the one that we're looking for in both cases. So let's multiply this out. 5 times x is of course 5x. 13 times 7 and a half, well let's see, 13 times 7 would be uh, 91 and 13 times 8 would be 104 and so in between I guess would be uh, 97.5 I think. And then we can divide each side by 5, of course, to isolate the x. And of course, x, well, let's see, 100 divided by 5 is 20, so 97.5 divided by 5 is 19.5. Uh, okay, so this is 19.5. So we've got two of the components of the wire. Now what we need is this third component of the wire. Now this is a fairly complex one. I'm just I'm looking at it over here. The only way that I can think of to solve this, and there may be other ways that I'm missing over here, is to draw kind of a an imaginary line over here in order to figure out BC using the side of a triangle. Because as of right now, it's really just a trapezoid. Not sure how to figure out the top of the trapezoid over there. So let's draw this imaginary line over here. Okay, now we've got a triangle here, and let's see what we can do to fill in the dimensions. Well, of course, common sense indicates that this has to be the same as this. This also has to be 15, and the reason is these are both altitudes. They both go straight up from the same line, so they have to, you know, just keep going straight up. So this has to be 15. Now we got to figure out the this whole thing over here. We know this little part down here is 12 from here to here. What about up here? Well, let's figure out what the whole side is. The whole side, this whole side, let's say from here all the way up here, we could figure out using the same proportion, you know, from like this is to this as that is to that. So let's say 5 is to 12 as uh, 7.5 is to x. Again, trying to figure out this whole thing. Same thing as we did before. 5 times x is 5x. 12 times 7.5, well, let's see, uh, 10 times 7.5 is 75. Uh, 2 times 7.5 is 15, so that's 90 altogether. Again, you could do these on a calculator. There's no reason why you have to do it in your head. I just uh, happen to want to do it in my head, but either way. 
and then uh, divide by 5, divide by 5, and x equals 90 divided by 5, which is 18. So this whole thing from c all the way to the bottom line over here is 18, and we know that this area is 12, so this area up here has to be 6. And so now let's figure out how far it is from b to c, and for that we can use the Pythagorean theorem. And for the Pythagorean theorem, this is the hypotenuse. So again, we've got a squared plus b squared equals c squared. a squared is 6 squared. b squared is 15 squared equals x squared. This is not going to come out to a whole number, but anyway. Uh, it's 36 plus uh, 215 equals x squared. So this comes to 251 equals x squared. So we need the square root of 251. Let's get out our calculator. And figure out the square root, which is going to be 15.84 approximately. So we'll, we'll call this 15.84. So if we add them all up, 13 plus uh, let's see, 13 plus 15.84 is 28.84, and 28.84 plus the 19.5 is 48.30. I'm sorry, 48.34, of course. So altogether, we need approximately 48.34, uh, the length, to cover all this wire over here. Again, we had to just use the, the Pythagorean theorem a bunch of times. There might have been a simpler way to figure this out, but this was the uh, easiest way that I could figure it out. Homework 9 is about circles, our first uh, foray into the area of circles. And when it comes to circles, we are going to look at various rules, of course, that are relevant to this particular homework. And our first four questions, all of them, are relevant to this particular scenario. We've got a circle over here. Uh, we've got this is 50 degrees, that's 85 degrees, and we've got a bunch of questions based on these. Now, C is not the center, necessarily, of the circle. A little confusing. You would, it seems like, uh, you know, if, well, if the C is probably the center, but it's not the center. If it were tell you that C is the center of the circle, then things would be a lot easier to deal with, but it doesn't say so, and therefore we can't assume anything. Okay, now, before we even look at this, I'm going to, you know, as, as we did earlier in the course with other things, I'm going to start filling in things that I know to be true. Well, this is 50. Now, the rule is, in terms of a, a, a angle circumscribed on the edge of a circle, that it opens up to an arc that's double whatever this angle is. So this arc over here is going to be double whatever this angle is. Now, we know that this is 50, so we know that this arc, in other words, the number of degrees from here to here in a circle is 100 degrees. Now, because this angle opens up to the same arc, it also has to be 50 degrees. It's the, the general, one of the rules is that <coughs> any two angles that open up to the same arc have to be congruent to each other. OK, that is uh, fairly self-explanatory. So let's take a look at some of these questions over here. Uh, first of all, name two inscribed angles that intercept arc BD. Now, arc BD is here. OK, that's, um, now what two inscribed angles? Inscribed angles are angles uh, that are on the end of the triangle. So it's really just this angle and this angle. So the two angles that I see are DAB. That's this one, and this one, which is BED. Okay, I'm going to skip number two for the moment, uh, just because that's a different kind of a question. Using only the points given, name all of the angles that intercept arc AE uh, and indicate whether each angle is central, inscribed, or neither. Central is, un is if it's in the center of the circle, if it's inscribed in the center of the circle. Inscribed is if it's on the end of the circle, or neither, of course, neither. OK, arc AE is this. So there's angle ABE, that's this one. And that's inscribed. I'll 
I'll just say INS for inscribed because it's on the edge of the circle over here. Then you've got EDA, which is inscribed. And then you've got this angle over here, which intercepts arc AE, ACE, which is neither because it's not an inscribed angle because it's not in the end of the circle, and it's not central because, again, C is not the center of the circle. In fact, C can't be the center of the circle because if it were the center of the circle, then all the angles on either side of it would be exactly 180 degrees, whereas we know over here the arc is actually 185 degrees, so C actually cannot be the circle. Name two minor arcs and two major arcs and two semicircles on the circle. Well, the minor arcs are these two, AB and ED, those are the smaller arcs. The bigger arcs are BD and AE. And semicircles, hmm, because C is not the center. If C were the center, then the semicircles would be AED and ABD. Uh, you know, I'm looking at this one over here, angle EDC. I, I said I'd, I'd hold before. I'm just looking at it over here. I don't know if really there's a way to solve this. I mean, if C were the center of the circle, then it would be easy. If C were the center of the circle, EDC, well then, if C were the center of the circle, then this arc would have to be the same as this arc, because of course this angle is the same as this angle. And two central angles have to and have the same um, the central angles have the same as arc measure, so this would be 100, and that would be 100, and that would be 100. Um, and so because if, the, if this were a center, then this would be 100, that would be 100, that would be 100 degrees, which means that EDA would also be 50 degrees. Now, C is not the center of the circle, uh, so honestly, I'm not 100% sure how to do this one here. I'll have to get back later on in order to uh if if I if I figure it out I will uh, I will let you know but I, honestly I'm not 100% sure that this is actually possible but I'll certainly get back to you later in the recording um if I if I do later on figure it out Okay but in any case let us go to um let us go to the next question which is number 5 which I'm going to put up over here once again points A, B, and C are on circle O. Oh, by the way, if you, in case you're wondering what happens if I can't figure something out, you're not going to get a question on an exam unless we test it and make sure make sure that we have a readily accessible answer. So I, you know, the, if you know the rules, you should be okay. In general, I think the exam questions aren't going to be as hard as the homework questions anyway. Okay, points A, B, and C are on circle O. Now, circle O means that the, cent that the O is the center. That's an important thing to know. Uh, a, C is um, 20 inches let's you know let's make this figure a little bigger uh, in order to uh, be able to draw on it uh, all right you know let's delete this one here let's delete them both and bring this circle here okay good um, sorry about that. I'll just erase this. Okay. There we go. Now we've got point A, B, and C are in circle O, and um, the, R, the line, the diameter, A, C, is 20 inches. So we'll say it's 20 from here to here. Okay. A, C is 20 degrees. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. A, O, B a, O, B is 120 degrees. Find the following. B, C. So in other words, this line over here. Measure angle B, A, C. This angle over here. <coughs> and the area of the shaded region. Okay, let's start with what we know. Now, if this, this obviously is a straight line. So if this is 120, that has to be 60. <clears throat> and also, 
If this is 120 degrees, that means the arc of BC also has to be 120 degrees. Now if the arc of A, excuse me, the arc of AB has to be 120 because this is a central angle. A central angle is the same as the arc. Now what about this inscribed angle over here? Uh, ACB. Well, ACB has to also be 60, right? Because ACB is one is an inscribed angle, which is one half of the arc that it intercepts. Now, so if this arc is 120, this has to be 60. Now, if this is 60 and this is 60, this also has to be 60 in order to equal up to 180. So this is actually an equilateral triangle. Now, so if it's an equilateral triangle, we could figure out all of the sides because, well, this was 20. Now, because this was 20, the distance from here to here has to be half of that. AOC is a uh, AC is a diameter, which means OC is the radius, which is half that, so that's 10. So that, of course, has to be 10, and that has to be 10 also. So we will say that BC, we figured out segment BC equals 10. Okay, so now we figured out part A. Now we need to figure out uh, angle BAC. Okay, well, that should be simple enough, right? Um, if this is, there are, there are many ways you can figure this out. First of all, this is a semicircle. A, B, C is a semicircle, which means if this is 120, then this arc has to be 60, because a semicircle has to have a total arc of 180. If this is 60, so this inscribed angle has to be half of that, so it has to be 30 degrees. And the, and there are not, the other way to figure that out, of course, is that this central angle, BOC is a um, is an inscri is a uh, is a central angle and an inscribed angle that intersects the same arc as a central angle has to be one half of its measure for obvious reasons. If this is half of the arc that it intercepts and this is the full arc that it intercepts, this has to be half of that. Either way, measure angle BAC of course has to be 30 degrees. And there are probably other ways you could figure that out also, but we don't really need to do that. Now the area of the shaded region. Okay, well this is a two-step process. The first thing we are going to want to do is figure out the entire area of the semicircle, and then subtract the area of these two triangles. Well, let's, you know, let's, rather than, let's draw the whole diagram over again, because uh, if, if we have all this busy stuff going on in the middle over here, that might confuse things a little bit. So let's get this thing again over here. Now what's important here? Okay, let's draw in the information that we have that's going to be relevant to area. Now the area of a circle in general is pi r squared. Okay. What's our radius? Well, remember, our radius was 10. And remember, this was an equilateral triangle, so this was 10 also. This was 10 also, but the point is that we are going to look at the radius, which is, uh, which is 10. So the area of the whole circle is 10 squared, which is 100 times pi. So we'll call it 100 pi, because the radius is 10, so radius squared is 100, so it's 100 pi. So the area of the semicircle, you know, of this whole semicircle, which is going to be the most relevant part, is half of that, of course. So that's 50 pi. So essentially, our the area of the shaded region is going to be 50 pi minus whatever these two triangles are the entire semicircle minus what the areas of the two triangles are. Now a triangle, the area of a triangle um, is always the base times the height divided by 2. It's always the area of a triangle. So what's the height over here? Well, a little complicated, but we can figure it out. We're going to have to draw an altitude. The height of, an, uh, is, of the triangle is always an altitude. So I'm going to draw an altitude down here and figure out what is the length of the altitude. I'll use a different color for that. Now to figure out the length of the <coughs> of the altitude, well, we have to, you know, this this side was 10 of course. 
This side was 5, because it's half of this, the altitude, in a, in a uh, equilateral triangle bisects the base. So we can figure out this side, we'll call it S, using the Pythagorean theorem. Well, let's use it X. Let's call it X for the time for the time being. Okay. So the the using so figuring out X using the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In this case, we'll call side a five. Uh, b is this side. We don't know what it is, so we'll call it X equals c squared. And this that's the hypotenuse here, which is ten. So we have 25 plus x squared equals 100. Subtract 25 from each side. x squared equals 75. And so x equals the square root of 75. Let's use our calculator to get the square root of 75. Round it off. And we've got 8.66. OK, we'll round it off to 8.66. That is the, the height. OK. so. Figuring out the area of this triangle is base times height over 2. Now the base of the triangle was 10 times 8.66 divided by 2. Now 10 times 8.66 is 86.6 divided by 2. So the area of this triangle is 43.3. OK, so that's the area of this triangle. 43.3. Now, the easy, the good part is, is that this is really the same thing. It's got the same base and the same height. The height is just the altitude. The height is from the highest point to the lowest point, which is the same thing for this circle as it is for this circle. In fact, the area of this is going to be the same as the area of this, because it's got the same base, which is this, which is 10, and it's got the same height, which is 8.66. So this is 43.3, and the other is also 43.3. You know what we could have done? I just realized rather than doing it as two separate triangles, we could have looked at it as one big triangle here, which has a base of 20 and a height of 8.66. And it would have, done, it would have been the same calculation overall. So our answer is 86.6, which is the area of the non-shaded region over here. So we've got 50 pi, which is the whole semicircle. Now let's figure out what 50 pi is. We'll round off pi to 3.14. So we'll say um, 3.14 times 50 equals 157. So it's 157 minus 86.6. And 157 minus 86.6. Really shouldn't need a calculator for it, but we have it open anyway. Why not use it? 70.4. So our answer is 70.4. So again, what we did was to figure out the area of the shaded region. We took the entire semicircle's area and subtracted whatever was not shaded, namely this big triangle or the two little triangles. Either way you want to look at it. And question number six for homework nine. Points A, B, and P are on circle O. O, A is 10 centimeters. Let's mark that in. Okay, O, A is 10. And measure uh, of the angle, AOB is 80 degrees. Find the following. Arc AB, well that's easy. <laughs> and in, in, in circle a, a, in a circle angle, a circle um, central angle has the same measure as its corresponding angle. The arc has the same measure as its corresponding angle. So the arc is of course 80 degrees. So that's obvious. We can just fill that in right away without even looking at anything else. Uh, measure angle ABP, A, PB, excuse me. Okay. Now there is none, but you know we can always draw one. I don't see why not. Uh, let's draw one. ABP. So let's start with A and go to B, and then go from B to P. Well, this is, of course, an inscribed angle. 
and an inscribed angle has the same measure of, as the um, as it has half the measure of the angle of, of the arc so this of course would be half of that which would be 40 degrees so this would be 40 degrees those are the easy ones the length of arc AB okay a little bit of a circumference problem over here now for that we need to figure out the circumference of the entire circle and then figure out the proportion or the percentage that arc AB is the formula for circumference of a circle the entire perimeter of the outside of a circle is 2 pi r now in this case the radius is 10 it tells you specifically that OA is 8 I'm sorry I wrote 10 over here but OA is actually 8 um, so it would be 2 times pi r the, the, ra the radius is 8 so 2 times 8 is 16 so c equals 16 pi okay now let's figure out what the percentage of it is of uh, now this arc is 80 degrees out of 360 now 80 divided by 360 reduces to 8 and 36 which reduces to uh, 2 and 9 I guess 2 out of 9 so I think that reduces the same yeah 8 and 36 and if you divide by 4 it's 2 divide by 4 it's 9 okay so it's basically 2 ninths of the entire circle so if you want to figure out what the circumference of AB is, what the arc AB is, it's 2 ninths of the 16 pi. So it's 2 ninths times 16 pi. Now if you multiply this out, 2 ninths is the same thing, uh, two, 2 ninths times 16 pi is the same thing as, well 2 times 16 is 32 over 9 times pi. So we can we can probably leave it as 32 pi over 9 or 32 9. Uh, um, if you want to actually get it into numbers, you can use a calculator estimating pi at 3.14. We'll say uh, 32 times 3.14 divided by nine and we're going to get about eleven point one six give or take so the whole circle is sixteen pi which is about fifty or so and this is about eleven point one six which is two ninths of that so that's in general how you figure out the length of an arc you gotta figure out the, what the circumference of the whole circle is and then figure out what percentage the arc is of the whole circle which is whatever number of degrees it is divided by three hundred and sixty because an entire circle of course has three hundred and sixty degrees Okay, let's take a look at homework number 10. Uh, more fun with circles, tangents, secants, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, by way of review, we've got two different types of lines over here. We've got tangents and secants. A tangent is something that runs from an outside point of a circle alongside of the circle. Like J and PJ and PT are both tangents to this circle. They both hit the outside of a circle. In fact, it says so. JP and PT are tangent to circle O, J and T. Uh, JP is 10, PU or UP is 5, and PI is 6. And they want us to find, the, first of all, the relationships, in case uh, you may not recall, the relationships between uh, tangents and secants are that they're the, uh, the, the tangent is the mean proportion between the outside component of the secant and the entire secant. These are secants. I don't know if I mentioned it, but PE is a secant, PR is a secant. A, pecan, a secant is any line that starts outside the circle and ends all the way on the other side of the circle. Basically, when you have a relationship between a tangent and a secant, like let's say, for example, PR and PJ, so in this case, PR would be to PJ as PJ is to the entire is to the small line PU or UP. Uh, essentially, the the tangent is the mean proportional in between. Like the mean proportional means the on the bottom of both uh, of both and bottom of this fraction and top of that fraction between the short uh, the part outside the circle and the entire thing altogether. 
Okay, so let us take a look at how we would figure out all of these um, answers over here. PT. Now, PT is an easy one. The rule regarding uh, fractions, I'm sorry, the rule regarding tangents is that all tangents, or really there can only be two tangents, and be, you know, from one point to a circle, one can go here, one can go over here. You know, if you had another line way back here, and we wanted to draw two tangents, uh, then there could also be only two tangents from here to the circle. That one would look something like this, and the other would look something like this. There could be two tangents, and the point is the rule is very simple. The rule is that they're equal to each other. They have to be equal to each other by definition. Any two points from outside to the same circle have to be equal to each other. If you draw a few of them, you'll see why. It's fairly common sense. And so therefore, since pj is 10, pt also has to be 10. Easy enough. Okay. The radius of circle O. Now the radius of circle O is obviously the distance from here to here, or from here, from O to R, or from O to U. It's the same thing. Now the only way to really figure that out is to figure out this entire thing. P-O-R. P-U-O-R. P-O-R. <laughs> or you can just call it P-R. And that's probably why they gave you U-P, because that's the only way to figure, out, figure it out eventually. But the first thing we're going to need to figure out is the whole P-R. Now remember, the general rule is that the tangent is the mean proportional on the bottom of one fraction and top of the other of the distance between the secant and this end of the circle and the secant and the other end of the circle. So essentially, UP would be as to PJ as PJ is to the entire thing, PR. That's, I mean, wrote it before in, with the UP and the PR reversed, but it makes no difference. It's the same thing. So let's fill this in, then we can do this again relatively easy. UP is of course 5, PJ is 10, equals PJ, which is 10, divided by PR, which we don't know what it is yet, so we'll just call it X. Cross multiply, 5 times X is 5X, equals 10 times 10, which is 100, divide each side by 5, X equals 20. Okay, now if X equals 20, and this part of it is 5, PR is 20, and this part of it is 5, that means you are, the diameter has to be 15, and which means each side of it has to be 7.5, because we're looking for the radius. This is 7.5, this is 7.5, that's 15, that gives you 20 altogether, so the radius of circle O is 7.5. Okay, and finally we've got EI, and you know, we do it the same way essentially. I'll use a different color, because uh, but where you do it the same, the same using the same proportion, same exact thing. Again, this time instead of UP, we're talking about IP. Is to again we can use the tangent, PJ. We could also use PT, which is the same, doesn't make a difference. PJ is to the entire secant, which is PE. Okay. Well, what's IP? Well, it tells us here that it's six is to ten as 10 is to x. Well, 6 times x is 6x equals 100, and so uh, x equals, looks like 16 and 2 thirds. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. 6 times 10 is 60, 30, so, yes. So it's 16, 16.66. 16 okay, well now they told you, they told you that pi was 6, I'm sorry, well, that's the whole thing. Um, right, so EI would be this section. So if this section is 6, if the whole PA is 16.66, and this section is 6, so that leaves 10.66 left over here. So EI would be 10.66. And that's all for question number one on this homework. Question number two. And let's see what we got here. Hopefully more fun stuff with circles. Oh, look, we do got, we have circles, secants, tangents, the whole nine yards, fantastic. Okay, RU is tangent to circle O as shown. Okay, ME, arc ME is 118, okay, degrees. Arc CE is 25 degrees. And MY, arc MY is 120 degrees. Find the following, RMU, this, MSC, 
this, M R Y, this, notice all three angles in the same triangle, and M U R, this. Okay, so these are actually fairly easy. The first one I see we can figure out right away is this one, M R Y, which is one of the ones that we have to figure out over here. Now, the 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 rule is for a secant, the angle of a secant, or two lines forming a secant, uh, two well two secants forming forming an angle, um, and which in this case would be R M and R Y, are one half of the difference between the arcs over here and over here. Just like, for example, on an inscribed angle, like EMU, it would be equal to this entire, it's one half of this arc, so two secants, it's one half of the difference between the arcs. So this angle MRY is one half of the difference between 120 and 25. So it's one half of 95 which is of course equal to 47.5. So we've got MRY. We've got MRY is 47.5 degrees. Let's write this in in case this helps us at all. 47.5. Oh. Anyway. Okay, uh, what else can we figure out here? Well, the next thing, and the next thing that's staring me right in the face over here, is that any tangent to any circle is going to be perpendicular to its diameter, to its radius. In other words, a radius or diameter is something that goes through the middle, which this line does. MOU goes, th goes right through the middle. And a tangent, like RU, this has to be perpendicular. This has to be at a 90 degree angle. Again, if you draw a few, you'll see why. It's fairly uh, obvious. Any kind of a tangent that you draw to any circle, if you draw a line, you know, just let's do it in, in, uh, in blue just to show you how it works. Let's draw a tangent on the other side, uh, which, which I'll erase in, after we do it. If we draw a tangent here, which will look something like this, and then we draw a line from the middle, from the middle to the tangent, It'll look something like this. You can see that's perpendicular. Anytime we draw a tangent to a circle and then draw a radius or diameter from or a radius from the middle to the to the tangent, it's going to be perpendicular. So this has to be 90 degrees, of course. That also happens to be one of the ones that they asked. What is that? M U R? Yeah, so this is 90 degrees. Okay, now well this one we can figure out just the fact that this is a triangle, right? I mean this is ninety and that's forty seven and a half, so this triangle, M U R, has to equal one hundred and eighty degrees altogether. So uh hundred and eighty minus ninety is ninety. Uh ninety minus forty seven and a half is forty two and a half. So this has to be forty two point five in order for this triangle, M U R, to equal up to one hundred and eighty altogether. So what R M U was forty two point five. And then, the last one is MSC. <coughs> well, this is also part of a triangle. This triangle is MSR, this whole triangle in the middle here, basically. Um, that would be the same thing. Well, this is 42 and a half, and that's 47 and a half. And uh, so that those two add up together to 90, of course. No, I made a mistake. You see what since the mistake I made? I'm not going to tape over this because uh, <laughs> I, well, I, it, pause it and see if you can see the mistake that I made. And then I'll have to tell you the mistake that I made and then we'll have to do it over. The mistake that I made in figuring out this was that this is 47 and a half, but it, that's not the whole angle. When I looked at it, I thought that was the whole angle. When I say MRU, the three angles are this, which is 90. That's true. This, the whole angle is not 47 and a half. The whole angle is, is going to be more than 47 and a half because the 47 and a half is only MRY, which is this component of the angle. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, apply to this component of the angle. So we'll have to figure it out in a different way. Okay, so looking at this for a couple of minutes while well, I had it turned off, I I figured I think I figured it out. I mean, again, sometimes you got to look at these things for a few minutes. It may take a little while. Okay, looking at this over here, well, this is a semicircle. A um, M, of course. Well, M O U is of course a a uh, diameter, and therefore this M E 
CU, this whole thing is a semicircle. Now if this is 118 degrees and this is 25, the arc of a semicircle of course has to be 180 altogether. So 118 and 25 is 143, and 143, um, that means that leaves 37 left. So I guess that would have to be 37 degrees, the CU arc. Yeah, 37 and 25 is... Uh, 62, 62, 118 is 180, exactly. Okay, so this has to be 37, so we know that. Now, if this has to be 37, then we can figure out these two angles. Remember, these two angles have to be um, have to be equal because they're vertical angles. And those two angles each have to be uh, the average of the intersecting arcs. In other words, these two arcs together have to be the same as the two angles together. So, if we, for example, take the average of, a, of 120 plus 37, so 120 plus 37 is 157, 157, um, Let's see, 157 divided by 2 is 78.5. So this has to be 78.5. This has to be 78.5. In other words, the total measure of the two angles, the two vertical angles, have to equal the combined measure of the arcs. So, okay, now we can looks like we can we can figure out the triangle S R U. Well, this is 90, that's 78 and a half, that adds up to 168.5, which means there's only 11.5 degrees left. 11.5 degrees um, is this angle over here, which means the total measure of this, and I'll use a different color, Again, there may be simpler ways to figure it out. I may be using the most complicated way for everything, but <laughs> so be it, whatever works. So this angle, M R U which is actually one of the ones that we had to figure out. No, I'm sorry, we had to figure out um, RMU. So, okay, anyway. So MRU is 47.5 plus 11.5, which is 59. Okay, so if this is 59, and that's 90, 90 and 59 is 149, that leaves 31 degrees left over here. 31 degrees for this angle. 31 plus 59 is 90, uh, plus 90 is 180. Okay, so at least we got RMU. RMU we got is 31 degrees. Now we need MSC, which is this angle over here. We'll stay with green. Okay, well this isn't so bad. So MSC, we've got the other two angles in this triangle. We've got the 31 over here, we've got the 47.5 over here. So these two angles, this one and this one, add up to 78.5. The entire thing has to be 180. So we'll subtract and get 101.5. So it looks like this angle has to be 101.5. So we have all our answers. Again, I, I, I may not be doing this the most efficient way, but just, you know, keep, as long as you know the rules, and there aren't that many of them, it seems like there are a lot, but there's really only, uh, you know, four or five rules that apply to each of these situations. And uh, somehow, if you just keep filling in as many numbers as possible, sooner or later, you're going you're gonna to figure out everything. Uh, just, just out of curiosity, if we wanted to know, you know, this arc, well, this arc we could figure out two different ways. We could figure it out um, that 101.5 is are these two angles, and this angle is going to have to be the the 101.5 times two is uh, 203. So 203 has to equal 118, which is this arc plus whatever this arc is. So it would be 203 minus 118. So that's uh, 85. This has to be 85. And now just to check it, let's make sure that... 
Well, anyway, let's let's not worry about that. We got <laughs> let's 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 look at we got plenty of actual uh, problems to do. So let's look at problem number three here. And question number three for this homework. We've got a clock over here. The minute hand on a clock sweeps, sweeps out 20 minutes. Now, 20 minutes, before we even look at that, 20 minutes is, of course, one-third of an hour. Now, one-third of an hour, one-third of a 360-degree circle means 120 degrees. We might not need that. We might need that. We'll see. I don't know. So if this, of course, is... 120 degrees, and this is also, of course, one third of the entire circle. If the hand is four minutes, four centimeters long, for this is also four, they're both hands, they're both radii, so they're both four centimeters long. What is the shaded area? I guess we can assume B is the center because uh, it's that's where the hands start on a clock at the center. So this is four, and that's four. What is the shaded area swept out by the hand showing the figure? So it seems to me very simple. What we're going to need to do is first figure out this entire area and then subtract the triangle here. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm still looking at this, and I spent a couple of minutes looking at it, trying to figure out what to do over here. And again, I think I figured out a way to solve it, although again, with my usual disclaimer, I will say that there might be a much simpler way that I'm just not thinking of. Uh, the way that I think of, basically, you know, we, we need what AC is, and we need the... We need to figure out what AC is, and of course we also need to figure out what the altitude is, because we need to figure out the area of the triangle. We need to figure out the whole area over here of this semicircle, and then we need to subtract what the area of the triangle is. You know, so first, before we even start, before we even do that, let's figure out the area of the semicircle. That's the easy part. Now, the area of the entire circle is, uh, the area of a circle is pi r squared, as we know. The radius is 4. So the area of the entire circle is 16, uh, 4 squared times pi. Uh, and the, so that means the area of the third of a circle, the area of this whole area over here, one third, that is one third of a circle, because that sweeps out 20 minutes, which is one third of the clock. So the area of the uh, one third of the circle is um, 16 divided by 3 pi, which is, uh, we'll call it, 16 thirds pi, or we can call it uh, 5 and a third times pi. Okay, either way, fine. Let's let's put that on the back burner over here, because now we know what the whole area is over here. Um, now we have to figure out what the area of this triangle is, so that we could subtract it in order to get the area of the shaded region. Now to do that, the only thing that I see offhand that might that would that would actually work is to draw a an altitude here, just draw it straight down here. This is an isosceles triangle, so the altitude bisects them. This triangle, of course, is equal to that triangle. And now we can use the use a little trigonometry to figure out the to figure out the um, to figure out the, this side over here. Uh, now this, of course, entire is 120 degrees because it's the same as this angle. So half of it would be 60 degrees over here. This has to be 60 by definition because this line splits the two angles. It, split, it bisects the angle. It goes straight down the middle over here. This entire thing is 120, so each one is 60. Now, if we have this as 60 degrees and this as 4, so we can use a little trigonometry to figure out this and this. Let's whip out our uh, calculator over here and so uh, so this is the hypotenuse of the triangle, and this is the adjacent side of the hypotenuse. Uh, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for this angle over here. The is So we're going to use the cosine. Remember, cosine is so kato. Uh, see, cosine is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So in this case, the adjacent side, which is what we're looking for as x, will be, um, let's see, the cosine. Now, what's the cosine of 60? Well, let's use our calculator to figure that out. We could use a chart or a calculator. So we'll say 60 degrees and put in a cosine, which is 0.5. Actually, I knew that, but all right. <laughs> so the cosine is 0.5. Um, so we'll say 0.5 equals the adjacent, 
which is x, divided the, divided the hypotenuse, which is 4. Now, if you cross multiply, very simple, it clearly has to be uh, 2, because 0.5 is a half, so this side also has to be a half. If you want to cross multiply it, you'd be x times 1, because this is really 0.5 over 1 over x. So x equals 0.5 times 4, which is 2. So x is 2. So I'm going to change this x into a 2. That's the altitude of the um, of the triangle, of this triangle over here. Now let's figure out what this is over here in order to figure out um, what the entire AC is. And we can do that two different ways. Number one, we can use the 60 and we can use the, the sine to figure out the opposite over hypotenuse. Or we could just simply use the, uh, use the Pythagorean theorem because this is a right triangle, of course. So let's use the a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And a squared is, let's say, 2 squared uh, plus b squared is x squared. We don't know what that is. Equals 4 squared. So that's 4 plus x squared equals <coughs> 16. That means x squared equals 12. And x equals the square root of 12. Now, <coughs> so this is the square root of 12, which means the entire base, the entire AC, is 2 times the square root of 12, because this bisects congruent triangles. So this, of course, has to be twice times the square root of 12. So air, base times height, the area of a triangle is always 1 half of the base times height. So in this case, the area of the triangle is 1 half of the base, which is 2 times square root of 12 times, um, times the height, which is 2. So the area equals, well, 2 times 2 is 4, half of 2 is 2. So really, I mean, we can take a half and 2 and just cross them out because half of 2 is just plain 1. So the answer is 2 times the square root of 12. So let's get, in terms of numbers, up here we've got uh, 5 and a third pi, and down here we've got uh, 2 times the square root of 12. So let's figure out what both of them are. I'll use even a different color. Let's whip out our calculator here. And, um, okay. So five, let's do the 5 and a third pi first. 5.33333, whatever, times and pi will round off to 3.14. So we're going to round it off to 16.75. So we've got 16.75 being the area of the entire third of a circle, this whole area over here. And then we're going to subtract the area of the triangle. And the area of the triangle was 2 root 12. So let's do that. Let's clear it again. Take 12 and take the square root of 12, that approximately 3.46. Again, we're rounding it off. Times 2 is 6.93. So we're going to subtract 6.93, and that equals 9.82, I believe. Okay. So that is the area. The area of the shaded region is 9.82 because the area of the whole of the whole third of a circle is 16.75. The area of the triangle is 6.93. Subtract them and you got 9.82, which is the area of the shaded region. Homework number 11. Okay, here we got. So we're going to start graphing for the next few homeworks. Let's draw ourselves a graph over here, and you know this is covered more in the algebra class as well. But uh, let's draw an x-axis and a y-axis. I'm going to do this the first time. After that, maybe I'll take some shortcuts. But you, what you always want to do whenever you draw uh, a graph is to put have an x-axis and a y-axis, put arrows on each side to make sure that you realize the graph goes forever or the axes go forever in each direction. Label the vertical axis the y-axis and the horizontal axis the x-axis. And of course that's positive 1, positive 2, positive 3, all the way to positive infinity. The, this is the y-axis positive, this is the y-axis negatives, and this is the x-axis negatives. 
Okay, points A and B have coordinates negative 3 and 5, and 4 and negative 3. Plot the, um, uh, plot the points, okay, that should be easy enough. Negative 3, 5 is negative 1, 2, 3, that's the x value, and in an ordered pair the first value is always the x value. 5 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so let us put this over here, and that's A. And then b is 4, negative 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, 2, 3, and that's b. And now they want, interestingly enough, the line segment. How long is this line segment? Okay, so we've done a, and let's do c first. c is the easy one, easy one, so that we'll just do first, and then we'll have to uh, get into something a little bit more complex when we look for how long line a, b is. So for the midpoint, just take the average, take what's in the middle. We got our two points, negative 3 and 5, and, and over here we have 4 and negative 3. Just take the average of the x and the average of the y. The midpoint, well, the average of negative 3 and 4 is positive 0 0.5, I believe. If you add them up, 4 and negative 3 is positive 1, divide by 2, that's how you get the average. And 5 and negative 3, well, 5 minus 3 is 2, and so uh, it's positive 1. The average between 5 and negative 3 is positive 1. If we want to plot the midpoint, we can do that by going 0 0.5, which is here, and positive 1, which is right about over here. Maybe my line wasn't precise, but that's about the midpoint. And if you're looking at it with the naked eye, you can tell that it's pretty close. Again, my drawing of the line might not have been 100% precise, but that is, I believe, the correct answer. OK, so let us now take a look at uh, the second part of the problem, and that's find AB. Now for AB, we're not going to need the chart, because this is a, simply an application of the distance formula. So I am going to uh, take the chart out. In fact, I'm going to take this stuff out too, because we already got our answers. So what I'm going to do is the distance formula. Now the distance formula, it's just really something you've got to memorize, You can, and that is the distance is the square root of the change in x squared plus the change in y squared. Change means the difference. I'm going to use the delta, which is the triangle, which means change in y squared. So let's take our x's. Well, our x's are, let's say, negative 3 and 5. I'm sorry, negative 3 and 4. Those are our x's. Our y's are 5 and negative 3. So you can go either direction. You can say this minus this or this minus this, as long as you do it consistently in both. So let's take the bottom minus the top for the difference in x. So the difference in x is 4 minus negative 3, which is 7. 7 squared. OK, the difference in y is negative 3 minus 5, which is negative 8, which is going to be the same thing as positive 8, because uh, any positive number squared is the same as the same as the negative number squared. So we'll call it negative 3 minus 5, which is negative 8 squared. So the distance is 49, square, uh, square root of 49 plus negative 8 squared is 64. Now, 49 plus 64 looks like 113, so the distance is the square root of 113. If you wanted to figure it out, what it would be, what the distance would be approximately, you can again just put in, whoops, ah, okay. Put in 113 and get the square root, and it's about 10.63. So the distance between those two things that we, that those two points that we plotted on the graph is about 10.63 boxes. Uh, you can usually leave it as a square root of 113 because that is an irrational number. So that is question number one for homework 11. Question number two, uh, let's see what we got over here. The coordinates of two vertices of an equilateral triangles, two ends of an equilateral, or two of the three points that end in equilateral triangle are 1, 1. Let's plot 1, 1, which is over here. And the next one is 5, 1 which is over here. We want an equilateral triangle. 
which means the distance between here and here has to be the same distance as the distance to the third vertex. Now, the th actually, there are really two different places the vertex can be. It can be somewhere up here, where it can be. This, of course, is 4. So this has to be 4, and this has to be 4. Or you can do it down here and put the vertex somewhere around here, and you, you can make an e equilateral triangle either way. I think it's a little simpler to make it uh, to, to move it this way. So the vertex is going to have to be somewhere up here. The problem is you don't know exactly where it is right now. You can't just put it up here, four spots up. In other words, this is one, two, three, four over. It doesn't go all the way up four spots because if we put this up four spots, I mean, just to show you what it would look like if we drew a triangle, clearly it would not be, uh, let me draw this with straight lines, clearly it would not be an equilateral triangle. I mean, you can see right away that the bottom side is not nearly as long as the as the top two sides. It's an isosceles triangle, but it's not an equilateral triangle. So we have to realize that this third point, which we'll make in yellow since we don't know exactly where it is, has to be, it has to be somewhere on this third line, because there has to be equidistant from both sides, but we don't know where on this third line it can be. So we're going to have to figure out we don't know uh, how far, we'd have to figure out some sort of a line from here to here. We don't know, well, let's use a different color because you can't see yellow. Uh, it's going to have to be somewhere from here to somewhere around here. We don't know exactly where it is. Let's just leave it somewhere around there, and it's going to have to be somewhere around here. Now, there is a way to figure out the length of this. We don't know exactly how, how high it's going to be, but there is a way to figure out the length. Okay, sorry about that. I left the uh, recording running for a little bit, so you just basically saw nothing for about a half a minute or so. Hopefully you hung on and are still with me. If you're not still with me, well, then there's kind of no point in discussing it, is there? Okay, let's draw axes over here. Okay, we want to make sure we can get a negative 10. Okay, now, first of all, it asks you whether PQ is perpendicular to QR. So let's draw PQ, obviously. P is negative 5, 6. That's negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Uh, 7, negative 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2. Okay and 1, negative 10. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So they want to know if PQ, oh, let's label them. This was P. This was Q and this was R. So PQ and QR. Let's draw the lines. PQ and QR. Okay, now do they look perpendicular? Um, they look pretty close to perpendicular. I guess you can't really tell by the naked eye. Uh, I'm trying to look, you know, at a diagonal. It looks slightly off perpendicular to me, but all right, anyway. But we don't have to look, fortunately. There's a very easy way to figure out whether they're perpendicular, and that is whether their slopes are negative reciprocals of each other. Parallel lines have the slopes that are the same as each other, and uh, perpendicular lines have slopes that are negative reciprocals of each other. Now the way to figure out a slope is always the change in y divided by the change in x. So let's figure out the slope of PQ. Now change in y means, what were, where are PQ? 
PQ is negative 5, 6, and 7, negative 2. So the change in Y, we'll call the second Y minus the first Y. Change in Y is negative 2 minus 6. Again, this one minus this one. That's the change. You can do it either direction as long as you're consistent with both. And it's doing the X and the Y divided by the change in X. This should be the change in X, which is 7 minus negative 5. 7 minus negative 5 is the same thing as 7 plus 5. That's the same as negative 2 minus 6 is negative 8. 7 plus 5 is 12. Negative 8, 12 is the same thing as negative, reduces to negative 2 over 3. Okay, so that is the slope of PQ. Now let's try the slope of QR. Okay, well, let's do the same thing. Change in Y, negative 10 minus negative 2 which is the same thing as negative 10 plus 2. Again, minus negative 2, so it's plus 2. And 1 minus 7 is on the bottom. 1 minus 7. And let's see what this is. Negative 10 plus 2 is negative 8. 1 minus 7 is negative 6. Now, negative 8 over 6 comes out to positive 4 over 3. So this is negative 2 over 3. This is positive 4 over 3. So they're not. They are not uh, perpendicular with each other because they do not have negative reciprocals. If this would have been positive 2 thirds, and this, I'm sorry, this would have been positive 3 halves. It would have had to, have, in order for them to be perpendicular, if this was negative 2 over 3, this would have had to have been positive 3 over 2. It's close. You know, 4 over 3 is close to 3 over 2, but not quite good enough. And so they're not exactly perpendicular, and I think if you've been staring at this the whole time, you might have also seen that they're not exactly perpendicular. See, this comes, seems to come in at a slightly sharper angle. This seems to be a little bit less than 90 degrees. But anyway, we figured it out mathematically, so we don't really have to rely on the naked eye, thank goodness. Question number 4. Okay. First of all, let's draw our coordinates over here for all these. Maybe I should have something saved with a nice graph with, with good coordinates. Again, you really should put arrows in x, y, but you know we'll dispense with that for the time being. Alright, so we've got a township has corners with the coordinates 0, 0, so that's at the origin, that's right in the middle over here. 7, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0. 7, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, and 2, 5, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, looks like a um, trapezoid here, so let's draw the trapezoid, use a different color to draw the trapezoid of the town, Okay. All right. So, what do they want? Remember that they're 580 uh, 5280 feet in a mile and that one acre is 43,560 feet. What is the nearest find the area of the township to the nearest tenth of an acre? Okay. So, this is in miles, I presume. Yes, they're given in miles. That's so in the question. Given in miles. So first thing we got to do is figure out the area of a trapezoid. Now the area of a trapezoid is always the average base times the height. Is the base uh, really the base one plus base two over two times the height? Ba that just means the average base. This is the longer base. This is the shorter base. This, of course, is the height. So that's easy enough. What is the b average base? Well, this base is 7. We just count them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This base is 5. So that's 7 plus 5 over 2. The height is, of course, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the area is 7 plus 5, which is 12, over 2, which is 6, times 5 equals 30. So the area is 30 square miles. 
Okay, so now we have to think quickly about the, or it doesn't have to be quickly, but we have to think about the number of square feet uh, there are in a mile. Now, a mile is 5,280 feet, which means a mile is actually 5,280 times 5,280 square feet. Square feet is two directions. If a mile is 5,280 feet that way and 5,280 feet that way, the total number of square feet in a mile is actually 5,280 squared or times 5,280. So that's actually the number of square feet in a mile. That's a lot. Uh, 27, looks like 27,878,400. That makes sense. Sounds like a lot, but th there really are a lot of square feet in a mile, over almost 28 million square feet in a mile. And how many square feet in an acre? 40, 43,560. So we can divide this, which is the number of square feet in a mile, divided by this, well actually there's, well there's 30, there's 30 square miles, I'm sorry, so this is just one square mile. This is how many square feet there are in one square mile. Our trapezoid, our township, has a, a um, an area of 30 square miles, so we're going to multiply that by 30, and this is how many square feet there are in the township which is 836,352,000. Okay, again, makes sense. Townships have a lot of square feet. Now we can divide this by this number to get the number of acres, because that's the number of square feet in an acre. So let us use the division divided by 43,560, and it gets you 19,200 acres. Okay, it says it gives us to the nearest tenth of an acre, but I don't really see the need to round off because it tells you that there's nine, altogether 19,200 acres in the town. Okay, question number five. I think that's the last question on the homework for homework uh, 11. Now, here we got four vertices four corners and we and they ask us to show that it is a rhombus. First of all we have to know how to get figure out the distances and then we have to know what the rules for a rhombus are. <coughs> we don't even technically speaking <coughs> need to draw this on a graph. We could figure it out using the distance formula, but it, it's a lot easier to visualize and I think a lot easier to do if you uh, if you draw it on the graph. So A is negative 2, 12. Negative 2 is 1, 2. 12 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You know, I'm going to have to <laughs> redo the uh, coordinates uh, to make it make this a little bit, to make this work a little bit better. So let me redraw the coordinates a little bit lower so that we can get everything in the chart. All right, not the coordinates, the axes. We're going to draw a little bit differently. Okay, no problem. Okay, negative 2, 12, point A, negative 2, 1, 2, positive 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way at the top. Okay, this is A. Now, B, negative 1, 1. Negative one, negative one, excuse me. One, negative one. That's B. Ten, negative eight. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Negative one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All the way down here. And our last one is nine, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Let us draw the connectors for this quadrilateral, which we are going to have to prove is a rhombus. Okay, looks like a rhombus, feels like a rhombus, quacks like a rhombus, it probably is a rhombus. Alright, anyway, 
So what's the rule for a rhombus? Well, the rule for the rhombus is very simple. They all got to be equal to each other. All sides have to be equal to each other, which means that's right, folks. We got to do the distance formula four times. Uh, this was C, of course, and this was D. So, well, let's write the distance formula up here. D equals the square root of change in x squared plus change in y squared. In case you're wondering how this formula is derived, it's really just a <coughs> take off on the Pythagorean theorem. I, I'm not going to go into it now. How you, I can do that in, the, in a different section, uh, or you can just take my word for it, but this is really just the, a derivation of the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so let's take a look at AB. Let's try AB. AB is the distance is the change in Y. There's, excuse me, square root of the change in X. Now the change in X squared, now the change in X is negative 1 minus negative 2, so that's just plain negative 1, or 1, doesn't matter which one, we can do negative 1 squared, plus the change in y. Now the change in y you can see right away is going to be 13, negative 1 minus 12 is negative 13, um, so we'll say, again, it doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive, negative 13 squared. That means the distance is negative 1 squared, which is 1, plus negative 13 squared, which is 169, and our distance is the square root of 170. That's okay. It's nothing wrong with having an irrational number as your distance. We just got to make sure that all the other segments are the same. So this is the square root of 170. Well, okay, let's take a look at BC. Distance equals the square root of change in x squared. Negative 8 minus negative 1 is negative 7. So we'll say negative 7 squared plus 10 minus negative 1, which is 10 plus 1, which is 11 squared. Distance equals the negative 7, which is the, which is 49 plus 11 squared, which is 121. 49 plus 121, sure enough, is 170. So distance is square root 170. Hmm, that's so far so good. Square root of 170. Let's figure out the other two, and I'm going to have to take this out, or this area out over here, because otherwise we're not going to have any room. So let's apply the distance formula two more times. Hopefully we'll get a square root of 170 both times, and then we will have our proof. So now let's try CD, which is this line segment. Distance equals the square root of the change in x. 9 minus 10, negative 1, okay, negative 1 squared, plus 5 minus negative 8, or positive 8, 5 plus 8, which is 13 squared. You might see a pattern, that's the same basic numbers we had with when we did AB, which makes sense because this is parallel and equal to AB. So that's 1 plus 13 squared is 169. Distance is the square root of 170. Congratulations. And finally, we've got DA, or AD which we have to compare this to that. Okay, let's start with the change in x. 9 minus negative 2, which is negative 11. I'm sorry, positive 11 minus negative 2 is positive 11 squared. And then the change in y is 5 minus 12, which is negative 7 squared. 11 squared is 121 plus negative 7 squared is 49. Again, you may recall those numbers from BC because again, AD is parallel and equal to that, and your distance is the square root of 170. That makes this the square root of 170. We've done all four distance formulas. All four sides are the same, and because all four sides are the same, that makes it a rhombus. Now, if they would have also asked us to prove that it's not a square, <laughs> you know, because a square is really just a type of rhombus, um, and so we could, it, 
Thankfully, it didn't ask us that. If it did, you know, it would just be a little extra work, but it would be fairly simple. All we'd have to do is prove that the that one of the one of the pairs of segments are not perpendicular to each other. In a square, all the segments are all the sides are perpendicular to each other. We would just have to figure out the slopes of let's say AD and AB or AB and BC and prove that they're not negative reciprocals of each other. And if you look at this with the naked eye, I think it's it's very apparent that this is not a square. But that's okay. It didn't say. It didn't tell us that it's a non. It didn't tell us to prove that it's a non-square rhombus. It just told us to prove that it's a rhombus, and we did. So congratulations to us. And now we are on to homework twelve. Okay, let's take a look at this. This not. A, we're not going to use the actual axes for all of these things. Write the equation of the line that goes through five four and is perpendicular to the line with the equation of four x minus. 2y plus 5 equals 0. Now the thing is, in order to get any equation, the first thing we have to do is get it equal, get it into y equals mx plus b form. And the way to do that is to get the y on one side and the numbers on the other. So the easiest way to get y on one side is to solve for y is to add 2y to each side. If we do that, then we get rid of the y from that side and we add y to the other side. I'm going to put the y in the left. It doesn't really matter that much, but I'm going to put the y in the left. So 2y equals whatever's left over, 4x plus 5. Now we can isolate y by dividing every term by 2. So we've got y equals 4 divided by 2 is 2x plus 5 divided by 2, which we'll leave as 5 halves. So that's this equation. So this equation is y equals 2, um, 2x plus uh, 5 halves, or plus 2 and a half. You can write, write it like that also. It's fine. Now <coughs> we want the equation that runs through the lines of 5 and negative 4 and is perpendicular. Now perpendicular means that it has a negative reciprocal slope. Negative reciprocal in this case, negative 2. 2 is real, I'm sorry, 2 is really 2 over 1, so the negative reciprocal is negative 1 over 2. So the slope of our new line is going to be negative 1 over 2. That's what we know so far. But what we don't know is the y-intercept of our new line. We know the y-intercept of the old line, but we don't know the y-intercept of our new line. Our new line is going to be y equals negative 1 half x, because we know the slope. The slope is whatever's ne next to the x, plus b, but we don't know what the y-intercept is. <coughs> and so let us go ahead and figure that out. Uh, and the way we can figure it out is by using this point, by plugging in our y values and x values as is indicated in this equation. So we had y equals negative 1 half x plus b. Let's use the 5 and the 4. Instead of the y, we'll use the 4 because that's our y value. Equals negative 1 half times 5 because that's our x value plus b. And this you'd solve like any other equation. 4 equals, well, 1 times 5, so it's negative 5 halves plus b. Add 5 halves from each side. We'll call it 2.5 to make it look a little bit more normal. Uh, and so 4 plus 2.5 is 6.5 equals b, which means that the final form of our equation, this was the form, so we've got y equals negative 1 half x, or negative 0.5x would be also be fine, plus 6.5. This is the equation of a line <coughs> that is parallel to this one, because this one had a slope of 2, and had a y-intercept of 6.5. OK, next question very similar, maybe even slightly easier than the one that we just did. We've got an equation, and it's 2y equals negative 3x plus 4. And our first issue is to rewrite in y equals mx plus b form. To do that, all you really need to do is solve for y. Now here, all you need to do for y is just divide by 2 to isolate the y. When you do that to 1, you've got to do it to the other terms here. So you've got y equals negative 3 halves. Let's call this 1.5. It just looks a little bit more normal. Negative 1.5x, that's the same thing as negative 3 halves x, plus 4 divided by 2, which is 2. So we've already done a 
We've written it in y equals mx plus b form. That was easy. What's the slope? Well, the slope is always the coefficient of the x. Whatever's next to the x is always the slope. And so the slope is 1.5, or 3 halves. Now they want us to show that 2, negative 1 is on the line. The only way to figure out whether a particular point is on the line is to plug it in to the y and x values and see if it works. So the equation for the line was y equals 1.5x plus 2. Let's plug in these values and see if they work. <coughs> for y will change to negative 1, 1.5, x will change to 2, plus 2. And of course, I made a mistake before, which hopefully you caught. This was negative. Remember, there was a negative sign over here that I forgot somehow. So this was actually y equals negative 1.5x plus 2 was the equation. And the slope was negative 1.5. Very important. I messed that up, but that's okay. We can look back. I was wondering why it wasn't working as soon as I saw this equation. And then I looked back and realized, oh, that's right. <laughs> I forgot that little negative sign, that pesky little negative sign over there. So let's see if this works. And this, I think, is going to work. <coughs> negative 1. Well, negative 1 and a half times 2. Well, 1 and a half times 2 is 3. So it's negative 3 plus 2. And of course, negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. So negative 1 equals negative 1, which means it works. And therefore, the line 2, negative 1 is on the line, because it works. OK, next question, question number three. We got two equations, and they ask us to solve the systems of equations. Now, you can do it algebraically. You can solve the equation that way. But in our example, we're going to try to do it graphically. The way to solve equations graphically is to plot them both on a graph and see where they meet. Oh, well, that should be pretty easy. Let's take the first one. First one, let's graph. Let's make that red. So we've got y equals three, 2 thirds x plus 5. Now the way to graph an equation, put a little chart here where you got x and y, and put whatever the x value, y is 2 thirds x plus 5, okay? And let's take three values for x. Let's take 0, 1, 2, why not? Okay. So 2 thirds times 0 is 0, plus 5. So in this case, y is 5. In the second one, it's 2 thirds times 1, which is 2 thirds plus 5, which is 5 and 2 thirds. And the third one is 2 times 2 thirds, which is 4 thirds, or 1 and a third plus 5, which is 6 and a third. Let's plot this line. 0, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then 1, 5, and 2 thirds, which would be something like this. And then the next one would be 6 and a third. Let us draw a line that represents this equation. OK. And then let's draw it the opposite way, also. OK, I think this, OK, this is about right. So this is our first equation. Now let's graph our second equation. I'm going to delete this. I hope when we get to our second equation, it's going to be, uh, it's going to crisscross better. Anyway, so what's our second one? Our second one we got 2x minus 3y minus 3 equals 0. Well, I'm not going to write it again. We have it right there anyway. Now, <coughs> here we do have to solve. The first one already started in y equals mx plus b form. <coughs> here, <coughs> sorry, we'd like to get it in y equals mx plus b form first. Now, to get it in y equals mx plus b form, get the y's by themselves. So you can do this term, add 3y to each side. Again, I'm going to put the y term on the left. So 3y equals 2x minus 3. Divide by 3 to isolate the y. Divide that by 3. Divide that by 3. And you've got y equals 2 thirds x minus 
minus one. This doesn't make any sense. They're never going to solve. They're parallel to each other. They got the same slope. If they have the same slope, they're parallel. If they're parallel, they're never going to intersect, ever. And in case you don't believe me, let's do it. We only got the problem from the book. It's not my fault. Well, maybe it is for now. But anyway, this is not going to work. You got x and y. Let's see. First of all, let's just make sure that we didn't make any... Okay. Um... Let's see over here. We'll do this again. This was 2 thirds minus 1. 2 thirds x minus 1. Again, let's do 0, 1, 2. 2 thirds times 0 is 0. That's a negative 1. 2 thirds times 1 is 2 thirds minus 1, which is negative 1 third. And the third one is 2 thirds times 2 is 4 thirds uh, minus 1, which is 1 third. All right, let's put this. 0, negative 1 is here. 1, negative a third is here, 2, negative 2 and 1 third is here, and when we draw this line, you can see it is going to be parallel to the red line up there. Anyway, so you can see these two lines are parallel, unless I'm making a mistake, and again, I'm just looking at the two slopes. This one is clearly, the, the two slopes are both two, th two thirds, and for this one, um, again, yeah, it's two thirds, they're both, okay, well, we got the two lines, you can see they're parallel to each other because they have the same slopes, any two lines with the same slopes are parallel to each other, this is not solvable. There's no way, even if we tried to do it algebraically, there would be no way to solve this because these two lines don't meet at all, ever. Okay, question number four. State the equation of a... Okay, sorry. State the equation of a circle in general form which has a center of 5, 3, and a radius of 9. Now, the standard form for an equation with the circle is... If the circle is in the origin, then it's just x squared plus y squared equals whatever. You know, for example, if it's 9 or 25, or it could be anything. And in this kind of a scenario, the radius is simply the square root of this. You know, the square root of whatever that number is, which of course would be 3. So a, a, uh, an equation like this would simply be a circle with the center at the origin and a, um, a radius of 3. You know, if I'll, I'll show you, rather than graphing, which is very hard to actually graph a circle if you have my artistry skills, uh, I'll use a, I'll use this, which is a website that graphs stuff for you. And let me go, um, so this, which is x squared plus y squared equals 9, you can see what it looks like. It's basically a circle. I mean, it is a circle with the center at the origin, 0, 0, and the radius is 3. If I changed this to 25, for example, then the radius would simply change to, whoops, I did 15. If I did 25, then it would simply change to a radius of 5. You know, the, the radius would be, it would go 5, the circle would go 5 in each direction. Now, if the center is not at the origin, then what you need to do is put it in this form, which I'm going to write over here. Uh, x minus whatever something called h, I'll tell you what that is, plus x minus k equals the radius squared, where the h is the x value of the center, and k is the y value of the center. So in our example here, that would be x minus the x value, which is 5, x minus 5 squared, plus 
uh, x minus k, which is x minus negative 3, because k is the y value, so which is negative 3, which turns into plus 3 squared, equals the radius squared. What's the radius? Well, it says the radius is 9, so 9 times 9 is 81. So this is the equation for a circle general form with a center of 5, 3, and a radius of 9. In order to test out, let's write it in here. What's, what's our, uh, what did we get over here? Let's make sure that um, we get the correct equation here. We had, let's say, x minus 5 squared plus, this should be y, whoops, okay, y plus 3. Let me correct that. Before we go, let's change this to y. I'll just erase it, and then I'll take out my little pen over here and make this into a y. Fine, OK. And then it equals 81. If we got this correct, then the radius should be 9, and the center should be 5 and 3. And let's see if that works. 5 and negative 3. And let's take a look over here. Let's see, where is the center? The center is right here at 5, negative 3, right here. That looks about right. Should be right over here, the center. That's right. And uh, the radius, whoops, the radius should be 9. Let me drag these down so you can see the whole circle over here. The radius should be 9, and that seems about right also. In fact, let's see where the center is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, it's 9, nine in every direction. So this is the correct uh, equation. The next one is a hard one. <laughs> The next one we have to use a method called completing the square. Hopefully you're familiar with that from the algebra class. If not, well, then you need to kind of relearn that a little bit at this point. We got a, like a really weird form of an equation over here and they ask us to change it into a circle form. Well, okay. We're going to have to convert this into a form that we saw before, you know, x minus h squared times x minus, or y, I did it again, y minus k squared equals the radius squared. Okay, in order to do that, we're going to have to set up two perfect squares, one with the x and one with the y. I'll keep the 11 and the 0 because those are the constants. But we're going to want an x squared here and a y squared here. And what, else, what other x terms do we have? We've got an x squared term here. We've got a plus uh, 2x term over here. And for y, we've got a y squared term and a minus 4y. Either way, we're going to need to add a last term to complete the square to get it into this kind of a form, to get it into an uh, x minus h squared form. If you don't recall, the way to complete a square, the way to get this down into a single term that is squared, is to put a number over here that is going to force the trinomial to, force to be broken down into two binomials that are the same. And the way to do this is to take half of this value, whatever it is, and square it and put that number over here. Now, half of 2 is, of course, 1. 1 squared is 1, so we can put the 1 over here. Let's do that over here. Again, let's say half of negative 4 is negative 2. Negative, four squared, negative 2 squared is positive 4, so let's put a positive 4 over there. I'll take out the underlines to avoid confusing you, and we'll put a positive 4 over there. Now, the reason why this will complete the square is that x squared plus 2x plus 1 is the same as x plus 1 times x plus 1. That's the whole point of completing the square. You know, x times x is x squared, plus x, plus another x is 2x plus 1. That's, you know, when you FOIL it out. So this is really the same thing as x plus 1 times x plus 1. This 
of course, is the same thing as y minus 2 times y minus 2. So that's really going to be the purpose. But before we even get there, you can't just add these numbers out of the blue. I mean, you know, the great thing about algebra is you can do anything you want to one side, but you've got to do the same thing to the other side. So we added a 1 in here, okay, so that means we've got to add a 1 to this side. We added a 4 over here, so we've got to add a 4 to this side. So, <coughs> let's look at the next step. This is the same thing as x plus 1 times x plus 1, so we're going to rewrite this as x plus 1 squared. This is the same thing as y minus 2 times y minus 2, so we're going to put... I'm sorry, I, I left out a plus sign here. So we'll put the plus sign in there. Uh, y minus 2 times y... Uh, so that's, this is y minus 2 times y minus 2, which is y minus 2 squared. Minus 11 equals 0 plus 1 plus 4, which is 5. Now, we still don't have it quite finished yet. We almost have it there. But we need to get rid of this constant over here. And now, so we can do that by adding 11 to this side and adding 11 to that side. And now we've got x plus 1 squared plus y minus 2 squared equals 16. Now we've got it in the appropriate form. What is the center? Well, the center is the negative value over here. Remember, this is x minus h. So it's whatever the negative value over here is. So the center is negative 1, and whatever the negative value here, and the negative of negative 2 is positive 2. So the center should be negative 1, positive 2, and the radius. Well, the radius, remember this is r squared, so it's the square root of whatever this is. So the radius is the square root of 16, which is, of course, 4. In order to make sure that we're correct, I am going to bring up my equation grapher over here. And let's see, what should we write over here? Well, we can use this, or we can even go one step further. Oh, let's, let's, let's use this. x plus 1 squared y minus 2 squared, uh, and that equals 16. Of course, our radius is going to be 4. This should be 2. I don't know why I wrote 3, but that should be 2. And our circle is going to be... Um, here's Okay, here's our circle. Our center, we said, was negative 1, 2. Negative 1, 2, right here. It looks about right. Looks exactly right, as a matter of fact. And the radius should be 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, it works. Let's write the whole thing over again, by the way, the whole equation, and see if it comes out to the same the same one. You know, it better come out to the same one, but let's make 100% sure. Let's write the whole thing. x squared was uh, plus y squared uh, plus 2x minus 4y minus 11 equals 0. And when I press go, it better stay the same <laughs> because this is the, it's really we just kind of alternated it and moved it around a little bit when i press go bang stayed the same see the the number of seconds it took to complete changed a little bit but the it stayed the exact same thing because all we did was reformulate the equation by completing the square key with this is you got to you got to uh, expand it and make sure to put a number over here that's going to cause it to be the same binomial times itself so that is how we got that answer and let's take a look at the last question for this homework, which actually is a very easy one, so I'm just going to zip through it here. Write the standard form of the equation shown below. Well, where is the center over here? Well, the center is the origin. Center is right in the middle, so we don't even have to worry about minus h and minus k or whatever it is. So we know right away that it's simply x squared plus y squared. There's no minus h or minus k because the center is right smack dab in the middle. Equals what? Well, it's the radius squared. What is the radius? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Obviously, the radius is 5. 5 times 5 is 25. And that is the whole standard form for the circle shown here. 
Okay, homework 13. ABCD is a rectangle. This is we're going to do transcriptions, uh, transformations, things like that. Things that are actually a little, think a little less complicated than a lot of things we've done so far. But let's get to it. ABCD is a rectangle, which means opposite sides are equal, etc. Point E is the point of intersection of the diagonals. Now, in a rectangle, diagonals bisect each other, diagonals are equal, all diagonals have all are uh, not necessarily perpendicular, but they are equal and they do bisect each other. Determine which of the transformations, A to D, can be used to map the rectangle onto itself. In other words, a, which change will leave everything the way it is? A reflection with respect to B, D. Okay, if B, D reflects is where every point, it's like kind of mirror, where every point is the same on either side of it. So reflection of the entire image with respect to BD, BD is this line over here. Well, let's figure it out. If you flipped everything, if you translated everything from one to another, would they be equal? Well, let's take all the individual elements. If you take BD, BC, and reflect it over BD, let's draw the reflection line over here just to make it nice and clear what we're reflecting. This, well, you know, let's not use black. Let's use red to make it a little bit more clear. This is the reflection line. Well, let's see. If you reflect BC over BD, what's going to happen? Well, is it going to go all the way to AD? Not really. You know, if you flip it over this line, it's going to look something like this. I mean, the reflection, let's, let's draw BC for a second. Again, let's use a different color. Uh, if we have BC over here, if we want to reflect it in AB, well, again, if, assuming this was a mirror, it wouldn't go all the way down here. What it would actually look is something like this. You know, it would look like a line that's the same length as BC, but it would be reflected over in this direction. So already, I think that a reflection in BD is not going to work. So we are going to, uh, so not A. What about B? A rotation around E of 90 degrees. Rotation is just kind of turn it counterclockwise. Now that's definitely not going to work. <laughs> um, in fact, we can just we can actually test it using Microsoft uh, Paint over here, that are the one the program that I'm using. A rotation around E of 90 degrees. I'm going to rotate it by 90 degrees, and it looks like this. It, it went went on it it went on its head. So uh, let me rotate it back. Okay. Um, it it was standing upwards. It was standing vertically. It wasn't it wasn't sitting horizontally. So that doesn't work. Uh, reflection with respect to AD. Well, okay. If you flip the entire thing over AD, it would be the same size and the same shape. It'll be on the other side. In other words, it would be somewhere over here. The entire shape would have kind of reversed over here. So that wouldn't work. D on the other hand looks like it would work. Rotate around E of 180 degrees, which means one full revolution. If you if you take it and you flip it entirely around once, it's going to look the same. In fact, so that actually will work. Let's rotate it 180 degrees and see what happens. Well, same basically looks the same as it did before. I mean, these words up here look different, <laughs> but uh, but the 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 shape itself looks the exact same. You flip it around, and uh, so that actually will work. So. D is the only one that I see so far. And E, which of these transformations can be used to prove that diagonals are congruent? And of course the answer is E, because when you, D, excuse me, rotation around uh, E of 180 degrees, you see the diagonals won't have changed at all. Even though the diagonals will be in the opposite, instead of AB, AC going to the right and DB going to the left, it will be, let me rotate it. Um, hmm. It will be CA going to the right and BD going to the right and DB going to the left and AC going to the right, but it's all it's all the same. So because of that, that shows that the di diagonals will look the same regardless of which ones in which position, showing that they are equal to each other, showing the, showing that they're congruent. The next question isn't really much about math. It's really just about stating, you know, what seems to be fairly obvious. A map of a state includes county lines A, 
the county lines, excuse me. Um, a new map of, of a particular county is to be drawn using the state maps. That the county map is four times the area of the county on the state map as shown. Explain how this might be accomplished. Well, uh, one possibility is just simply to increase all the dimensions by four. Multiply ED by four, DC by four, BC by four. This is what's called a dilation. A dilation is when you change everything by the same factor. So that's simply just explain, multiply all the, all the dimensions over here, each line segment by four, and eventually you're going to have the area. Actually, I'm sorry, check that. If the area you want four times, so the distances only have to increase double. I think, you know, we discussed this in, in a previous homework. So the, because a square, area is a square measurement, whereas length is a linear measurement, is one dimensional as opposed to two dimensional. So if you want to increase it four times, you really only have to make it twice as big. Uh, so really increase by two, increase AB by two, BC by two, CD by two, ED, just make everything two times the size that it was, and you should have four times the number, the area. I mean, just to give you an example, if we had a, uh, you know, if we had a box that was one by one, and then you have another box that's two by two, instead of making it one by one, we'll make it two by two. Uh, let's see, is this, is this approximately double uh, in each direction? Well, let's see, it's, let's assume that this is about double, well, this is not perfect, so let me try to, let's make a red box that's double, approximately double the size. Okay, uh, I think this is somewhat similar to double. In other words, this is twice as wide and twice as tall, but it's going to be four times as big. You know, one box, two box, three box, four box, because you 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 have to square. Uh, you know, if you if you um, for example, if you have let's say a, a three a you know a two by two, and you made something like this. So if you increased this by two, by the number of boxes, in other words, if you doubled this, if you had two, if instead of two boxes in this direction, you had four boxes in this direction, and four boxes in this direction, instead of it being, uh, instead of it being four boxes, it would actually, instead of it being four boxes, it would actually be 16. So in other words, if I doubled this, and I made it go, you know, twice as long this way, and twice as, you know, twice as long that way, and you can see the red shape. It's maybe four wide as opposed to two wide, and four tall as opposed to two tall, but instead of being four boxes, it would be enough room for 16 boxes altogether. Hopefully that's fairly self-explanatory. Okay, question number three. Now here, I see everything is going to be in the positive domain, so I'm going to draw my axes. This is a transformation problem, so I'm going to draw my axes way down here and put the whole thing in a positive quadrant, and even so, I might not have enough room to get everything in. Let's so let's make this the x-axis and this the y-axis. It doesn't really matter where you draw the coordinates, I'm just drawing it because I want to have enough room to plot all the, regu the relevant points over here. Okay. In fact, this time I'll even put the arrows. Arrow here, arrow here, arrow here, arrow here. This is the y-axis, this is the x-axis. Okay, great. Now we've got three, we've got a triangle here, ABC. ABC has vertices 0, 0, so we'll put A over here. 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 here, so we'll put B here. And C, which is 2, 8. 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this is C. Let's draw our triangle. Alright. Okay, so we've got our triangle, our red triangle here, fine. Okay, good. Now, they want to um, sketch ABC and its image A prime, B prime, C prime, C prime under the size transformation with center A 
With center A simply means that you're using that as the starting point of the dilation. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, A is the center of the triangle. Obviously, A is not the center of the first triangle, and it's not going to be the center of the uh, of the of the last triangle. It's the basis upon which you're measuring everything else. So, based on that, since it's the origin, that's actually very convenient. We can say, okay, um, so A prime is still uh, is still zero zero because that's the center of dilation. So we're going to say that's we're going to maybe color it orange also and make it an A prime. Now B prime, we can we had have a scale factor of two point five. So we can multiply the each the x value and the y value by two point five. Now the y value is still zero. The x value turns to fifteen. Right, six times two and a half is fifteen. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, and the y value, so really this is b prime, so a prime was still 0, 0, the dilation of a, b prime, the dilation of b was 15, 0, the dilation of c is 2.5 times to each one, so 2.5 times 2 is 5, and 2.5 times 8 is 20. So it would be 5 and, t uh, so it would be, yeah, 5 and 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Well, we almost got there. You see why I wanted to make a big one. Anyway, so we'll, we'll just put, we'll put it up here. We'll guesstimate it. Uh, now, let's draw our circle, I'm sorry, our triangle, of course. Whoops. Okay, there we go. The base of the triangle is going to run through here to the end over here, and then the last line, the longest, or the this side of the triangle is going to be this. Now notice, of course, that the lines to the bigger triangles ran right through the lines of the smaller triangles, but it just, it's, you know, it's a bigger triangle. It's a similar triangle, by the way. It's got all the same angles. Uh, in case you're curious about how we prove that it has all the same angles, well, angle A and angle A prime are the same point, so obviously those are the same angles. Um, and well, I don't know. They just are the same angles, <laughs> uh, so so they they all have the same same uh, same degree same number of degrees. Uh, but of course, this one, the, the orange one, is 2.5 times as long in every direction. Okay, so that's the coordinates of a prime b prime, which we already wrote over here. If a point has coordinates a b, what are the coordinates under its image under the size transformation? And of course, that would be exactly what we used uh, for a 2.5. Um, for a 2.5 uh, times dilation, so that would be 2.5 a and 2.5 b. Our last uh, homework question for homework 13 has the unfortunate uh, task of having the word similitude in it. <laughs> similitude, of course, just means not necessarily similar, but the way in which one shape in this context can be transformed into the other. Now, here we got two examples over here, a 3-4-5 triangle and a 12-16. Um, you know, we could even, we don't even need to, but we can easily figure out what A prime, B prime is. That's the hypotenuse. We can use the Pythagorean theorem. Um, I mean, there are many different ways. I'll tell you right now that the, the, this is going to have to be 20. And the reason why it has to be 20 is very simple. First of all, uh, this, it's what's known as a 3, 4, 5 triangle. You know, when you use the Pythagorean theorem, uh, thing, if the hypotenuse is 5 and the other two are 3, and uh, can be 3 and 4. So 12 and 16 are divisible into 3 and 4, so 20 is also, it's the same ratio basically. 3, 4, 5 is the same ratio as 12, 16, 20. Anyway, but that's not the point. The point they ask over here, what is the similitude that takes ABC into A prime, B prime, C prime? Well, so we have to describe it as completely as possible. The first thing it's doing is it's transforming. It's, it's, it's uh, reflecting in a line down the middle over here. 
So one thing I might do, and there are different ways you can describe this. There may not be a perfect way or an imperfect way to describe it, but I may put a line over here, and maybe I'll call this line L. And so the first thing I will say is that reflect A, B, C, triangle A, B, C, in line L. And that will give you a prime c prime b prime c prime, but it won't. It'll, be, it'll still be a three four five. You know, it's just it's just flipping over, and it's the opposite. But it's still three four five as opposed to twelve um, fifteen as uh, twelve sixteen twenty. So the second thing you need to do is you need to dilate. You know, using a size transformation sorry I'm not writing very neatly of 3 everything's being multiplied by 3 the 3 is being oh one second no that's no that didn't work I'm sorry I mean this the second part of it is true it, everything is being multiplied by 3 or by 4 actually not 3 what am I talking about by 4 3 turns into 12, 4 into 16, and 5 into 20. But the problem is, is that that doesn't work because you see what, oh, okay, so you see what's happening over here. If that would, if it would just be flipped, then the 4 should be over here because the 4 should be opposite the 16. So it's not actually being reflected now that I take a look at it over here. It's not really being just reflected in line L. What is actually happening? We don't even really need line L to reflect it anymore because what's actually happening it looks like it's being before it's being dilated or after it's being dilated it's being rotated so let me get my pen back over here uh, before it's actually being rotated because the 3 is going to the bottom so it's kind of being rotated um, it's being stood up so it's being rotated counterclockwise 90 degrees this is kind of being stood up. Is there any way that I can illustrate my point? Rotate 90 degrees left. See? Look at that. You see that? Oh, perfect. Isn't, isn't Microsoft great? Anyway, see, now it looks more like this. I, I'm, I'm rotating it 90 degrees to the left, or 90 degrees uh, counterclockwise, because now I'm standing it up to the point where the 4 is comparable to the 16, the 3 is comparable to the 12, and the 5 is comparable to the 20. Before I did that, um, the 4 was not, and if I just flipped it over, if I rotated it, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't work. I'll, 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 I'll illustrate that. Uh, if I just rotated it by um, flipping it horizontal, which would be ro um, flipping it over an angle, see this wouldn't work. You can see uh, that the four is on the side where on the, what should be the smallest side, and the three is on what should be the bigger leg. So that wouldn't work. So the only thing that would work is if I rotate it. 90 degrees to the left. Now you can see that it's uh, it's comparable to this shape with just a dilation of three. So I'm going to change this, and I'm going to say that this we can rotate. Triangle ABC. 90 degrees counterclockwise. I guess we can always we can also say to the left, but I think counterclockwise is slightly more correct, because it's only left if you're looking at the screen. If you're on the screen looking out, then it would be right, but all right, anyway, so that is counterclockwise. I guess the same thing is true with clockwise and counterclockwise, but anyway, so we'll call it counterclockwise.